So uh, welcome everybody. We are <clears throat> extremely happy to have you join this uh, symposium. It's the fifth symposium we are organizing at the University of Chicago, the third with Dr. Ritu Verma since uh, she joined the University of Chicago. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of national and international speakers that I would like to thank. And uh, what we wanted to do today is really focus on clinical questions that are of direct interest uh, to uh, our patients. And so we will be really focusing on healing in celiac disease, uh, diagnostic and spectrum uh, of celiac disease, meaning, you know, how uh, can we explain the different clinical presentations? How can we explain symptoms in celiac disease? And as always, we are going to uh, tightly link uh, clinical um, presentation with more basic science to really help you understand the underlying mechanism. <clears throat> There's going to be a very special guest today, uh, the founder of the Celiac Center, Dr. Stefano Guandalini. So uh, we are absolutely delighted to have him join today. And it's an honor to have him here. So Ritu, if you, and before I finish, I wanted also to give a big thank you to our executive director, Rachel Lieberman. Uh, she did an amazing job in uh, organizing uh, this meeting. So, uh, Vito. Good morning, and thank you, Vana. And I totally echo that um, Rachel has done an amazing job putting this together, getting all of us here on time and uh, working through with the uh, different uh, technical issues. And I also want to thank our tech support. Um, they have been phenomenal. And I'm sure you'll see through the course of the day, we could not have done it without Rachel and without our tech support. Um, so, you know, as Bana said, um, it's one of these things with celiac disease. There are so many facets to celiac disease, but we all know that it is an autoimmune disease and a genetic condition. So we all talk about this as clinicians. Um, we do know that children and adults present with so many different symptoms. And often the question comes on is why does one person have no symptoms and one person has diarrhea and nausea? Uh, why does this happen? And uh, most of us say, oh, well, that's what happens. Um, but hopefully today, as we go through the day, we'll be able to learn a little bit more. I think there's still so much more that we need to learn, but we'll learn a little bit more more looking at the basic science, looking at from a molecular, cellular level, uh, why is it that there are these differences? Um, what do we do traditionally is we think someone has celiac disease, we do a blood test, we check the antibodies, the antibodies are elevated. Majority of us in this country uh, do an endoscopy and we move along, make a diagnosis, and then uh, talk about seeing our dietitian friends because really the treatment currently that we have is a gluten-free diet. And then we see our patients after that and some of them recover totally. Some of them don't recover. Some of them have some symptoms. Why is that? Why is healing different in certain people? So these are questions that Vana and I have been sort of talking about and then put together these experts. I mean, we have worldwide experts here today through the day who are going to share some of the information raise a lot more questions. And I'm sure by the end of the day, we'll all be saying, now what? What do we do next? And we'll have a lot more that we would need to talk about. So really trying to understand why are the differences there? How do we heal? Does healing happen or does it not happen? And how should we be testing in the near future? So the way the sessions are set is we have four sessions. The first session will start momentarily. Uh, we will have a series of speakers and then roundtable. Please send in your questions through Q&A. We will address those questions with the panelists. We have a fantastic group of people who will share their knowledge um, throughout the course of the day. But the questions will not be answered after each, each speaker. Um, to help me moderate this fantastic session, I would like to invite Dr. London onto the screen. Um, so it is really my honor to have Dr. London here joining, who is all the way from Oslo. He is a professor and head of clinical education at the Institute of Clinical Medicine at the University of Oslo. He's also a senior consultant gastroenterologist at the endoscopy unit. His clinical expertise besides celiac disease is advanced GI endoscopy, 
inflammatory bowel disease and many other conditions. And another thing that I learned during this whole process as we were trying to put together, Dr. London also trains dogs. And maybe you'll share a little bit about that today, maybe a few minutes of that. And then um, we'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. So Dr. London, maybe before you introduce your speaker, you'll give us a little information about the dogs. Um, so before we hear about the dogs, um, <laughs> go ahead, Dr. London. No, 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 no. Well, actually, we are in the middle of the mountains now. Uh, so it's fantastic technology being able to participate in a meeting. So we've been out the whole day. We have uh, uh, 12, uh, we have a group of hunters. We have uh, uh, English setters uh, training them and uh, letting them run in the, in the field and uh, try to find birds. So that's, uh, that's the basic idea. I'll show you a picture later today. Okay, that would be great. And we're hoping our next symposium will be with you so we can see that all that stuff in real life here. Um, so I think um, I really, it's a real pleasure to be introducing all the speakers today. And I don't think that anyone needs a whole lot of introduction. So it makes my job very easy with this moderation for this session. But our first speaker is Dr. Joe Murray, who is a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and a fantastic gastroenterologist, uh, known Joe for a little while, and uh, not only as a gastroenterologist, but as a person um, really very uh, sharing of all of his knowledge and giving off his time. So thank you, Dr. Murray. You will kick this off with healing in celiac disease. So thank you, and uh, we'll go off camera. Super. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, as we talk about this important topic about healing and celiac disease. I have to some disclosures, which is, I think, a good thing because it, it illustrates a high level of interest in our disease, which had been ignored for many years. I always like to anchor um, my thoughts about celiac disease with cases people I've seen. Um, and this was a case of somebody when they were 16, uh, they had presented with diarrhea, abdominal pain, fatigue. Um, their um, TTG IgA was greater than should be 10 times the upper limit of normal. I had a biopsy that to showed total villus atrophy and intraepithelial lymphocytes that were more than 80 per 100 enterocytes. The patient, by the time I saw them, had been on a gluten-free diet for 24 months. The TTG IgA was now negative. GI symptoms improved, but fatigue was persistent, as was the symptom of brain fog and some abdominal pain, mostly bloating type abdominal pain. Repeat biopsies at this age, now 18, showed a villocyte crypt dep ratio of about 2.5 to 1. The intraepithelial lymphocyte count had dropped to 30 per 100 enterocytes. So what does that biopsy mean um, in terms of this person's clinical situation? So when I think of celiac disease, of course, we think of celiac disease as being largely reversible. It occurs in individuals who have a genetic predisposition. There's inflammation, villus destruction, and crypt hyperplasia. This can, as you see in the left, is relatively normal, not the most perfectly oriented sample, I would say, that you've got relatively healthy on the left and severely injured on the right. And these are supposed to be a two-way street, that when gluten is removed from the lesion on the right, it should go towards the lesion on the left or the um, circumstance on the left, and vice versa, that when you employ gluten or reintroduce gluten, it should go the other way. And inherent in that idea is the concept that celiac disease is a permanent intolerance to gluten. And indeed, um, our moderator, Knut Lundin, and his group have shown that this memory fidelity is extremely long-lived. So how do we define healing? And so I think of it as, does, has the person achieved something that looks close to normal? 
or has it improved? Both are important questions clinically. Is normal architecture achieved? That is the absence of villus atrophy and the absence of crypt hyperplasia. Can this be defined by a villus height crypt depth ratio above a certain threshold? Um, and then should that be a threshold that is based on the average of a number of areas with um, that you have sampled? Or is it defined as the worst of the areas that you've sampled? And those are really, I would say, still open questions. Complete healing, that is the restoration of normal architecture and the loss of excess intraepithelial lymphocytes um, is obviously what most patients would like to achieve if they were informed about the issue of healing. I also like to think of the concept of geographic healing. That is healing from the bottom up. We know that the bulb and the second part of the duodenum that we typically sample during endoscopy seem to be the areas most affected in celiac disease because it is largely a proximal small bowel disease. And they also seem to be the last area impacted as healing occurs. And one can look beyond the duodenum with technology such as video capsule or deep enteroscopy. When we think about healing, um, our first um, look at this was with Alberto Rubio Tapia, and we look back at ours. And I, for now over 20 years, have practiced a routine of routinely offering follow up biopsies in patients after one to two years of a gluten free diet um, without um, necessarily um, deselecting those who do not have symptoms at follow up. Um, so, a very systematic approach. And we found um, in this study that if we used a definition of architectural healing, that 33% had reached architectural healing by two years, 66% by five years. And these are all diagnosed as adults, all in a single center. Now we found that healing was slower in those who had total villus atrophy at the beginning, as well as those who had an initially severe symptomatic uh, presentation, so the typical malabsorption syndrome. Um, and again, this was driven by our policy to routinely re-biopsy those diagnosed as adults. And the suggestion was that there might be a borderline increase in mortality. And of course, a much larger Swedish study showed subsequently that there was no increase in mortality in those who had failed to heal. When we look at, and this is an aggregation of healing rates or healing recovery ratios for across multiple studies. And we can see that on average, MARSH is zero. That is complete architectural and inflammatory healing is achieved in just 36% of patients at 12 months. And the range is tremendous. It's from one to 82%. So there is a tremendous variability in the healing that is measured in patients at approximately 12 months. If we look at this issue of correction, architectural correction, the loss of villus atrophy, now this could include patients up to some degree of crypt hyperplasia, but where the villi have restored their architecture at varying measures, but this, uh, the, the median achieved was 64% achieved architectural healing at 12 months of a gluten-free diet. When comparing children with adults, it is clear that more children achieve healing, in this case, 65% of children achieving a higher degree of complete healing compared to a much smaller proportion of adults. What are some of the predictors of failure to heal? So age at diagnosis, we know the older you are when you're diagnosed, it appears the less likely you are to have healed. The diagnostic ratio, the, the, in this case, MARSH-3 ratio, the worse the damage, the less likely to heal. Men were less likely to heal than women. Um, there were also potentially issues uh, such as the age of diagnosis um, predicting the disappearance of villus atrophy. So these were associations um, that could predict healing. Now, Patients who have what about serologic tests? 
We utilize serologic tests quite frequently in following up patients with celiac disease. And in this study from Jocelyn Sylvester and colleagues, demonstrated that tests for tissue transglutaminase or endomesial antibodies at follow-up really do not detect most patients who have persistent villus atrophy on a gluten-free diet across a whole series of studies. So a negative test, serologic test, should not completely reassure us that the intestine has achieved healing. What about are we now? This is using serologic tests in the way they're intended to be used, which as an adjunct to diagnosis. However, we explored this because I'm not so sure that the diagnostic thresholds used for serologic tests are necessarily the right thresholds to use for follow up. And in this study, we looked at levels of serologic tests using the TTGIGA test with a human recombinant ELISA demonstrating that individuals who had undetectable TTG IgA, not simply negative, but undetectable, were much more, were more likely at least to have achieved architectural healing than those who still had detectable, but within the negative range. To be able to do this, however, you have to have an assay that is linear below the negative threshold. And many of the uh, serologic tests in use do not have sufficient calibrators to be able to carry that down, that linear relationship below the negative threshold. So what about recent studies on mucosal healing? Mandele reported recently that healing is expected in children, whether you're looking at villicide grip debt ratio, and here they compared it to control children. These are biopsies taken from children who did not have celiac disease and demonstrated that children on a gluten-free diet essentially approximated, closely approximated the villus high crypt depth. There is more spread in the um, celiac patients. And similarly, if you look at the, at the measurements of villus height, and we don't typically report this, but how tall are the villi and how deep are the crypts, that also they achieve approximately what is seen um, in controls. When one looks at the intraepithelial lymphocytosis, and this is not per 100 IELs, but is per millimeter of epithelium. One can see in total numbers that the gluten-free diet patients get very close to that of the control patients. And when you look at the uh, gamma delta TCR uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes, there still is a difference between those children who've apparently healed and the, the control patients. So it's not completely normal. Another look is, the, is this study from, from um, Finland, where they looked systematically at follow-up at one year approximately versus seven years. And they related the degree of healing to the degree of damage at the initial uh, bi biopsy. So individuals, if we look at the far right, all in taking all individuals, approximately 50% had achieved healing at, um, at, at 12 months. By seven years, it was virtually 100%. If you look at the distribution across the marsh grade at initial diagnosis, initial healing at, at 12 months is lower in those who had complete villus atrophy or marsh 3C. But in all groups, it had essentially achieved 100% healing. So if we are patient, healing will come, assuming the patients are um, <coughs> follow up, are, are following the diet. What about geographic healing? And there have been a couple of studies that have looked at geographic healing. We looked at geographic healing using video capsule showing that it's shortened from the bottom up. And this is the time with abnormality as, as a proportion, either as a total absolute time in terms of time when the capsule last enters the duodenum to when you see normal epithelium on the capsule. And that's shortened on treated patients in follow-up. Um, Maureen Leonard's elegant study looked at capsule before, after a challenge, and then after recovery, showing that they could also show um, the celiac time reflected a response to challenge and then a response to healing. So this is something not much investigated, but potentially would be a way to determine 
length of healing. And I often have to, um, I suppose, tell patients, you know, okay, yes, we've seen that you still have some villous atrophy, but most of your intestine has probably healed. We're just looking at the last remnant or residual parts in many patients. What have we learned from clinical trials? And I'm only picking a couple of, of pieces of information. Most of the clinical trials have included symptomatic treated patients, often with normal histology. Or they often have normal histology, despite having lots of symptoms. And then asymptomatic patients recruited into studies, often kind of unexpected damage. And placebo treatment in symptomatic patients often results in improvement in histology, possibly due to cleaning up the gluten-free diet more in, the, in some of those patients. <laughs> histology is responsive if it's done well quantitatively in either direction. And the variability of histology is also an issue. And I think of it as micro variability that's within the same biopsy or macro variability, which is between biopsies from different parts of the duodenum. This is a study, and I've just picked this study to focus on the screening histologic change. Um, and the screening histologic change in this study where they recruited patients doing well in remission. And one can look at the baseline groups, all of these before, this is their villus height crypt depth uh, ratio. Um, before being started on the, the Zadira tissue transutaminase inhibitor. And one can see that the villus height crypt depth varies from 1.5 to 2.5 across these groups. I think for most people, this would not be regarded as normal. In another study, and this was the celiac action trial, this was looking at the villus height crypt depth ratio in symptomatic patients in over 1,300 symptomatic patients, again, applying a quantitative histology measure. And one can see the distribution of the villus height crypt depth across this large population. And again, most of them are not achieving a level of what we would consider or would have considered normal. So they do achieve a villus height crypt depth ratio that we often regard as acceptable, the two to one or above would have been was regarded as essentially too healed to put in this study. So factors that may be associated with villus atrophy in symptomatic celiac patients on a gluten-free diet, in a study that Mahadeva did reviewing the celiac action histology, demonstrated that a shorter duration on a gluten-free diet, that's one to two years, was associated with a higher likelihood of persistent villus atrophy increasing age, positive serology, elevated ALT, and also the, the concurrent use of medications such as PPI, NSAIDs, and SSRIs. The other topic on healing is variability. And as somebody heals, they often become more variable. Or we also talk about patchiness of damage. In the two panels on the top is an example of two biopsies taken from the same patient showing fairly significant variability on two different biopsies. And then the bottom are two biopsies taken from a different patient showing more uniform, severe change. When we assessed the variability of histology, again, using the quantitative histologic analysis from the celiac action trial, we qualified or quantified micro variability within a single biopsy where we had multiple villus height crypt depth measurements done independently, and also macro variability between villus height crypt depth measurements across biopsies taken as a single session in the same patient. And basically, the associations were similar. So age at diagnosis was reversed. So a younger age was associated with more variability. The more normal the villus height crypt depth was, the average villus height crypt, the more, more variability there was, and also female sex was associated with it. So those were some of the uh, significant suggestions are, are behind the variability component. Another important area in healing, of course, is gluten exposure. And our Spanish colleagues and others have demonstrated that continued gluten exposure is associated with lack of healing. And this is one of the studies 
demonstrating that the repeated absence of gluten peptides in the urine of treated patients was predictive of mucosal healing. Um, and they proposed that this type of monitoring should be included in follow-up of patients with celiac disease. In addition, when you look at before and after going from baseline to healing, again from our Spanish colleagues, demonstrating that individuals who have positive fecal GIPs tended to have more persistent villus atrophy than those who did not. So again, thinking about that ongoing gluten exposure, of course, is associated with issues with healing. One caution that I think is reasonable to consider, and that is this, acute, acute gluten intake can produce symptoms before histologic changes. And IL-2 responses are now well recognized as responses to acute gluten exposure in patients with celiac disease. Of course, symptoms might be the response of a nocebo response, but it is important to recognize that symptoms can occur very quickly in patients with an exposure to gluten long before histologic change can occur. So in summary, healing is time dependent. It takes years in adults, probably weeks to months in children. The age at diagnosis is a determinant of healing. So not only do you need time to heal, but you need more time the older you are to heal. The serology using standard cutoffs, especially negative serology, is generally insensitive for ongoing inflammation, particularly if we use the standard cutoffs. But this requires, the use of serology as a monitoring test, requires a whole other level of interrogation um, by the um, scientific community to get the FDA and other agencies to agree that we can use serology um, for monitoring. Um, and unfortunately, there really is no incentive for serology manufacturers to do this. And I think it's up to us to study this. Um, healing is not necessarily predicted by symptoms or the absence of symptoms. So we should not be lulled into complacency that we can assume because a patient is seronegative and because they have no symptoms that their intestine has actually achieved healing. The concept of geographic healing, bottom up or patchiness, also need to be addressed. And certainly geographic healing may happen relatively quickly. And of course, I think all of us probably expect this and based on the fact that many patients' diarrhea, weight loss corrects relatively quickly. And it is some of the other symptoms, the dyspeptic, abdominal pain, bloating symptoms, that tend to be more, or even the non-GI symptoms tend to be more persistent. Um, <clears throat> the other is that it's relevant to the risk of complications. And I've not addressed this, but Ben Lebwal has shown that having persistent healing increases your risk of lymphoproliferative disorder. And there's older data, maybe not terrifically strong, that suggests it may be associated with bone disease, for example. And we need more long-term data in a systematic way that will address this. And of course, the other is the impact on the patient. How does even discussing healing or failing to heal impact patients? Do we need to, we do need to measure the impact that healing or failing to heal or even determining healing has on how patients function and feel. And where does the concept of healing have in a biopsy-free diagnosis paradigm, which is now over 50% of children in Europe and is rapidly spreading to include now being applied, not necessarily always correctly, to other populations? Coming back to our case. So what does this mean? What does this mild injury in the intestine, probably compatible in the past, I would have called this normal. Is this causing her continuing symptoms? Is this rather a functional gut disorder associated with anxiety, for example? But I could challenge this and say that, well, sporadic symptoms could be due to intermittent gluten, but not enough gluten to cause damage. And 
In this case, I've suggested to check the gluten uh, uh, immunogenic peptides in stool and urine whenever symptoms occur to see if it can actually be uh, uh, verified that these severe, often severe symptoms that occur intermittently are due to gluten exposure. So how do our guidelines tell us? The AGA practice update had suggested persistent symptoms, look for other causes, could intermittent gluten do it? Could symptoms be due to intraepithelial lymphocytosis alone if the architecture is normal? Does damage predict the severity of symptoms? Probably not. But they provide us with this, I think, reasonable approach that one, assess are they adherent or not? Look for whether there's damage or not, especially if they're older patients, consider evaluation for RC2, RCD2. And if there is persist, if there's no persistent villus atrophy, then I certainly will look for other explanations for their symptoms. If there is persistent atrophy in the face of substantial symptoms, then of course we're going to go down the pathway of um, more refractory disease, or also the possibility of gluten um, maintained disease. So, what does a clinician do? We address this issue of, um, of a villus, persistent villus atrophy and the issue of adherence to a gluten-free diet. What should a clinician advise if there's ongoing villus atrophy? Is this just natural slow mucosal healing? Certainly within a year or two. And in patients who are not that sick, I don't worry my patients particularly about that. I will follow them up. Could this be patients who are very sensitive to gluten? And we really don't have accumulated evidence yet on whether they're genetic factors that predict failure to heal. Is this due to ongoing gluten exposure? And certainly now our ways of measuring gluten exposure will be helpful. Or is it um, refractory celiac disease? But I put this last, and this is from Raj et al, is that you should really shouldn't think about refractory celiac disease first when there's failure to heal. We should think about these other processes. So what does healing mean to the patient? Well, when they've healed, I graduate them often from specialist follow-up. I congratulate them on their success of their gluten-free diet and affirmation of their efforts. It justifies or helps them justify their burden. Also, it can avoid the label. Also, we need to avoid the label of refractory celiac disease in patients who have symptoms but do not have any significant damage. And also, it probably has a reduction of risk for complications. So it is a cause for celebration. And I tell patients, instead of thinking you have a disease, celiac disease, well, you're a celiac, but you've healed the disease part. So what are the benefits of follow-up biopsies? And the asymptomatic, uh, a firm response to a gluten-free diet, perhaps important if there was never any symptoms, especially, I think, important in patients with a seronegative um, disease at the beginning, risk stratification for future follow-up, more dietary support, direct specialist resources uh, to others who are doing well. Those with persistent symptoms, is celiac disease responsible? Perhaps redirect to find other causes, identify refractory disease in those who are really sick, identify alternative diagnoses, especially in those where maybe it wasn't celiac to begin with and also find other endoscopic abnormalities. Though I have to say that for most patients, that doesn't seem to be much of an issue. Though I do see a fair percentage of people with reflux esophagitis, which has occurred after they've gained weight. And this is the um, reference to lymphoproliferative malignancy in those who have not achieved healing. And um, the one caveat about the large Swedish cohort is that many of them were not, in fact, the majority were not re-biopsied. 43% were unhealed. And this is a high relative risk of lymphoma, but is a low absolute risk. So it's probably not justified to scare most of our patients with, oh, you have not failed to heal, so we're worried about lymphoma. That should not be a major issue in most patients. And <clears throat> I'd like to end then with um, the recommendations. So biopsies for children, routine assessment of mucosal healing of small bowel biopsies is not recommended in children and only in selected cases in, on, based on, on specific clinical grounds. And just out are the ACG guidelines that suggest that, well, two things they say. One is that a, a, a mucosal healing is important, but they also say that while you should do biopsies in patients who have 
who've done well symptomatically, you can consider them in those who have who are doing fine with a shared decision making. Um, and but again, I would make the point that if you haven't got a biopsy, you really cannot determine healing reliably by any methods now. And then that's just the last year. Follow-up biopsy should be considered for the assessment of mucosal healing in adults in the absence of symptoms after two years. So I think we have to avoid the temptation to re-biopsy people after six months. I sometimes even see it after three months. But a year to two years, and I time it about six months to a year after they've gone seronegative. And again, that should be, like everything we do with our patients, should be shared decision-making between the patient and the provider. And I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Elegant as uh, as always. Um, I understand it. So, uh, Rita, we will go on with the next uh, talk now uh, without any uh, questions at this stage. The next talk will be a pre-recorded talk by uh, Dr. Thaddeus Stappenbeck. He's now chair of inflammation and immunity at Cleveland Clinic, where his research program focuses on determining the root causes of inflammatory and infectious diseases with the goal of developing new therapies for these diseases. Unfortunately, he was unable to attend the, uh, this uh, uh, Zoom session uh, uh, now. So we will see his pre-recorded uh, uh, session. So, so please stay in and thank you. Hello, uh, and thank you to Dr. Verma and Dr. Jabri for the uh, invitation to participate in this program. Uh, my, apologize, uh, that, my apologies that I could not participate in, uh, in person virtually. Um, I had uh, another uh, engagement that I had to, to, um, to attend to today, uh, but this looks like a really wonderful program. Today, uh, I'm going to uh, follow Dr. Uh, Joseph Murray's talk with a discussion now of the, the focusing on the epithelial response to injury and talk to you about a simple paradigm for how we're thinking, why, why we need to pay attention to this and why um, injury of these cells can, af can affect repair and recovery and how this might relate to celiac disease. So my interest in wound repair uh, in the intestine has uh, is actually been has been going on for quite some time. Uh, I've had some uh, amazing fellows in my lab, uh, Hiroyuki Miyoshi and Hiroshi Seno. Uh, they really pioneered this in in my group now over ten years ago. Uh, this our major focus initially was on the uh, colon, and uh, and they they pioneered methods to study uh, injury response and 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 repair in the colon. Uh, this involved. Uh, a small bore endoscopy in the mouse intestine, removing a small one mil millimeter punch, about 300 crypts, and then and then watching repair actually occur. And what they could show is that that the initial phase of repair were a, uh, these flattened wound associated epithelial cells that are post mitotic. They cover the wound, and once the wound is covered, then in the second phase of repair, epithelial stem cells and crypts that are immediately adjacent to these areas of injury expand. Uh, and form these channels, and these channels are then converted into uh, into crypts. Moving into the small intestine, this was really uh, the work of a, a wonderful PhD student in my lab, uh, Tak O'Hara. He was he was interested in in whether some of the principles that we were seeing in the colon actually would apply to the small intestine, with particularly for those wound associated epithelial cells that I showed within colonic repair. He wanted to know if there was something similar that occurred with village sandwich. Of course, what we want, to, what what the goal is, is to maintain normal, healthy uh, villi uh, that are covered by uh, differentiated epithelial cells, dominated by enterocytes, but but interspersed with various uh, secretory lineages. This, of course, is a high turnover system uh, driven by stem and progenitor cells at the base of the crypt that are highly proliferative. And as you heard from Dr. Murray, what happens in celiac disease and a number of other diseases, uh, inflammatory diseases in the small intestine is you can get over time loss of this villus structure and loss of the differentiated cells. And this can affect, uh, uh, it can really impact uh, patients physiologically with malabsorption. 
This is what this can look like, this in tissue section. These are these, these damaged villi that are present in on Crohn's disease in the distal small intestine or celiac disease in the proximal small intestine. They look a lot alike, a lot alike. There's a lot of inflammation, expanded crypts, and then these uh, atrophic villi that are present. What's interesting when we and others have been profiling intestinal epithelial cells under these two different uh, different conditions, we see um, a lot of similarities. We see loss of, uh, of a lot of functional genes within the intestinal epithelium. The, the epithelial cells will still be there, but, but transcriptionally, they've lost a lot of their capacity to, uh, to, encode, uh, to encode transcripts that, that encode proteins that, have, that play a role in, uh, in the metabolism uh, and transport of nutrients within these cells. So this is something that, that we're uh, quite interested in. Um, this is something you can see uh, here. There's loss of brush border uh, enzymes in uh, Crohn's disease. And similarly, this has been described in celiac disease you know, way back even in the early 1990s. So what's really going on here? Is this just an alteration in epithelial differentiation and complete epithelial maturation, or is it an adaptive response to injury? And we're gonna, I'm gonna pitch you that it's this latter. So how do epithelial barriers cope with, uh, with uh, drastic loss of differentiated cells during destruction? And so um, one, of the, one of the pathways we're gonna discuss here uh, at the end is gonna be the YAP pathway. This is, uh, this is a pathway that's, uh, where YAP is a transcriptional coactivator of TEED. This is, a, this is a pathway that can get turned on during injury and is well, now, well known now to, to play a role in intestinal epithelial stem cells during injury response. So it can, it can play a role in, in, the, uh, in the replenishment of LGR5 positive stem cells that are present in the base of intestinal epithelial crypts. And there's a number of models uh, that, that suggest how these uh, stem cells are actually replaced, whether it's a, a reprogramming of, of, of differentiated cells into new LGR5 positive stem cells, whether it's, uh, it's, it's quiescent stem cells that are revived uh, that should produce these active stem cells, or whether it's just simply making uh, more, uh, these IACs uh, more fetal-like. GAP plays a role in all of these processes. So what's the model um, that we with the, that Taka developed uh, within the system? So what he did is he took something uh, a, an older injury model that's well known uh, within the GI literature, which is injecting high dose poly IC. This interacts with uh, interacts with TLR three and causes epithelial cells to undergo apoptosis. What's really in, in, what's really interesting is it doesn't this apoptosis doesn't occur in the crypts, so this is not a stem cell injury model. It's simply a, a very simply an injury model of the differentiated cells on villi, and all lineages undergo apoptosis. And you can see within six hours you've lost a lot of epithelial cells, and the uh, the villi have accordioned uh, down. What's uh, what's great about this is is that this nadirs around 24 hours and then begins to bounce back. So you can look at you can look at the response of loss of epithelial cells within a day, and then how this this system begins to recover within 72 hours. So it's a really a really fast system to look at injury and uh, injury and then uh, response to injury. What's uh, what's important is at uh, 24 hours when you see the the this this kind of lowest level of the villi, the stumps that are present are covered by epithelial cells, but they're very much what, what I showed you before in the pictures of celiac and Crohn's disease. The, the cells lack um, really critical differentiation mar markers. This is a, a molecule ACE2 that's in the brush border of intestinal epithelial cells and is, and is absent uh, within these cells. Uh, so the cells not only not only morphologically are they different; they're now cuboidal instead of columnar. They lack uh, they lack basic uh, brush border enzymes uh, that that we would see. Um, and this is just showing that the ACE2 uh, this is this is at an mRNA level that there's a loss of ACE2 within these villus stumps. Physiologically, does this matter? Uh, and we think think that this does. What's what's interesting is if we just do a, a low uh, molecular weight FITC dextran. Um, administration um, orally to mice uh, at various times post poly IC, we can see that there that there's a there's a loss of barrier function, um, and and as the the, the FITC dextran can get into the blood, which can be detected. But once these uh, once um, once once the the system begins to stabilize and you get these atrophic epithelial cells, they're actually functional and they prevent this uh, they prevent this barrier, uh, this barrier dysfunction. So they really reestablish the barrier uh, and then allow the system to recover. So we, we've looked at, we've taken a, a look at, a very careful look at these cells uh, transcriptionally under a variety of circumstances, both single cell and, and through laser capture microdissection. 
Um, what's very interesting, uh, the, the, the punchline here is that these cells, these cells have uh, the, diff the, the, the uh, transcriptional signature that's actually very similar to uh, differentiated epithelial cells, but there are, there are some slight differences with elevations in, in uh, things like matrix disassembly and, and cell migration. So these cells are highly migratory, and they do have some loss of some of the metabolic processes that I mentioned previously. What's interesting is that both Crohn's disease uh, and celiac uh, uh, transcriptional profiles of intestinal epithelial cells show similarities to what we see here in these these uh, these laser mic these laser capture microdissected atrophic epithelial cells in this model. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of similarities that that are present here uh, with these two disease states. And one of the major uh, features of this disease state is this as a fetal signature. So again, this is something that that's well recognized to happen within the intestinal the intestinal compartment. But uh, what is uh, what's quite interesting here uh, is that this is uh, this is actually occurring within these within these cells that are lining these uh, these remnant villi as well these atrophic cells. And there are specific markers such as mesothelin and clusterin uh, that are part of this fetal signature that we see that are robustly, expect, uh, robustly uh, uh, expressed within these cells. We've done uh, signal, uh, single cell uh, uh, analysis, transcriptional analysis of these cells uh, and have, have a really nice signature of these atrophic cells. What's interesting is when we start, uh, we've, we're very interested now in comparing these to what's going on in patients with Crohn's disease and hopefully eventually uh, celiac disease uh, as well. But I can show you some of the comparisons with what's, uh, what we see in human Crohn's disease uh, uh, subjects. What's interesting is there, there's a specific uh, cluster of cells, uh, th these LCN2, what are called these LCN2 enterocytes that are present in the Crohn's disease uh, specimens, but not in healthy controls. And these cells line up really beautifully with our, with our atrophic cells in our mouse model. A lot of the markers that we see that are present in our mouse system are present, um, also present uh, in, these, uh, in these human cells. So we think what we're capturing here in the human disease state are these, uh, are these atrophic cells that are present in, in human disease that we can model in our mouse system. These, um, th these, what's interesting is that these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these atrophic uh, villus epithelial cells or AVEX express multiple lineages. So they're, they're, th what they are is a representation of all the lineages that are actually present. They have uh, enterocyte and some of them have goblet cell markers. So they are essentially, they're essentially um, adaptive versions of these normally differentiated epithelial cells. They um, are not, they don't contain, uh, they don't possess stem cell capacity. We labeled these uh, with the system using uh, keratin 20, which is only expressed uh, in, uh, in, it's not expressed in, the, in stem cells and crypts, it's expressed on surface uh, villus uh, epithelial cells. It's expressed both at homeostasis and in these, this atrophy situation. We then can uh, label these with TD tomato, collect these cells, and then test for stemness in vitro. And they basically, uh, these cells, whether they're from homeostatic or from, uh, from the atrophic uh, mice, the TD tomato uh, positive cells do not, uh, do not um, have any stem cell activity. So they're differentiated cells. Uh, they arise from, we've tested a number of situations where they arise from, and these cells appear to arise from transient amplifying cells that are present uh, when, um, and, that, and that are become expanded in the response to injury in this particular system. So um, these cells also are, are just temporary, temporarily cover uh, these, uh, these, uh, these damaged structures. We've done lineage tracing here in various ways. Uh, and what's interesting is that these atrophic villus associated epithelial cells um, only are present in, in, for a very short period of time and then get replaced by normally differentiated cells. So this is just a marker for mesothelin. You can see that it's covering uh, uh, the, these villus stumps at 24 hours. Uh, and then as we look over time, th these, uh, these, uh, these, these AVEX that are positive for mesothelian are only present at the tips of the, the expanding villi and are not, express, uh, not present at the base. So there, this is a very transient cell type that's present. So this is this is what's uh, this is with the paradigm that we're becoming very interested in is this are these AVEX that are that are present in damaged epithelium and then 
uh, they are replaced very quickly so that you can get normal normal villus um, regeneration. We're very interested in transcription factors that control the formation of these cells. Um, one of the major uh, signatures that we see in our, our transcriptional profiles actually is, a, is, a, is very much like what is seen in epithelial stem cells during injury. So it's, 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 it's YAP responsive uh, genes. And so we, uh, what we did is we, we looked at mice that lacked uh, this particular tr uh, transcriptional activator to eliminate this pathway. That to see if we could uh, to see if this would actually eliminate uh, these particular cells. Our hypothesis was is that this would this would be responsible for the generation of the AVEX. I'll show you that that's not what uh, that's not what we found, but what we found was something I think more interesting. So YAP uh, is activated transcriptionally, but and it's also we can see it just on tissue sections. So we can cut sections stained for YAP. YAP is uh, when it's in the cytoplasm is not active. When it becomes activated, it moves. It translocates to the nucleus. So you can see these atrophic uh, uh, villi are basically jammed with YAP positive cells, not only in the lining epithelial cells, but also within the mesenchyme as well. And again, it's this. It's these. Uh, these. Uh, these. Of AVEX cells that are really specifically uh, having this this YAP signature uh, transcriptionally. You can also see this in our in our biopsy model uh, that I mentioned previously. Uh, we see a YAP signature and and, and fetal signature in these uh, wound associated epithelial cells in the colon. So there's nice concordance there as well. What's interesting? Uh, so we we uh, we uh, ran our YAP knockout mice through uh, through um, our a poly IC model. What's interesting is they uh, maintain uh, a very poor uh, barrier function over time, uh, um, um, unlike our controls, um, and they, they actually seem to have a worse uh, worse barrier function. Um, but we but it's but the cells are still there. So initially we thought that they may not differentiate or at all and may not be there. But there actually is covering cells that are present uh, on these on these uh, remnant villi um, that that are present. So um, YAP is not required for the presence of these um, of these atrophic villus epithelial cells. And um, but it is but it is really a, uh, it seems to be necessary for their their functional uh, functional integrity. So this is just showing uh, just again mesothelial and clustering clustering being markers of these cells. Uh, looking now in our YAP knockout mice that are treated with poly IC at 24 hours, you can see that there's there's loss of mesothelial and clustering specifically within the epithelium. So so this is so this is uh, so. What we wanted to do is now is take this out a little further and see if there was an effect of lack of YAP as there was actually a recovery in this model. So now looking 48 and 72 hours post injury. And what was very uh, what was very interesting here um, is is that while you can see very nice recovery of villi that are beginning to expand um, here. Uh, in the uh, in the litter mate controls, the YAP uh, knockouts in the intestinal epithelium don't have this nice recovery. Instead, the villi are still still kind of stumpy and they're fused together. So we can see this both in histologic sections and we can see this in, uh, in whole mouth sections as well. And uh, this really, this, this villus regeneration uh, remains impaired. And so, so what's very interesting is taking out this, this transcriptional program um, allows the formation of these repair cells, but if the repair cells aren't functional, what's really interesting is the resulting villi, as you begin to, to repair out from the situation, actually can't form normally. So they remain fused, they remain very short and, and stumpy, and, and, and don't function very well. So this is the, uh, this is the, the message here uh, that I wanted to basically uh, leave you with, thinking about uh, celiac disease. And as we start really thinking about what's going on in, in patients with celiac disease with, with abnormal, uh, abnormal injury repair, it's, it's, it may be the case that, that there will be epithelial cells that will cover uh, these areas of injury in patients with celiac disease, but what I'm wondering is, 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 do they actually have intrinsic defects in their intestinal epithelium, whether they're genetic or whether they're induced uh, through epigenetics, so that these cells actually, these, these repair cells, um, don't allow normal villus recovery to occur. And uh, so this is something I think that would be quite interesting to study uh, as, as we move forward. And so um, I think I'm going to skip through this. And... Uh, go to go to the end. Uh, so this is essentially the model here. Um, 
is, is in terms of in terms of thinking about celiac disease. Think a lot about these repair cells, these reparative enterocytes, and reparative uh, cells that are present uh, in celiac disease, and how they may actually be modulating uh, the disease. So I thank uh, people um, throughout uh, the talk. So I'll go ahead and stop there. So thanks for your uh, attention. Uh, we do want to thank Dr. Steppenbeck for having taken the time out of his busy schedule and other things that are going on in life uh, and really um, do this recording for us and um, with a lot of learning and a lot of education for all of us. Um, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, my co-partner in crime in the Celiac Center here at in Chicago. Uh, Bana is a fantastic uh, co-director. She's the research person, the arm behind really pushing the research forward in uh, celiac disease here at Chicago. And I would say in the world um, that Bana is definitely a huge force. She is the professor of medicine and has a lot of different hats. And I'm just gonna mention a few. So she's the Sarah and Harold Lincoln Thompson Distinguished Service Professor. Vice Chair for Basic Research and Director for the Center of Human Immunology. Uh, Bana, I'm sure I'm missing out a lot of things, but more importantly, she is a person I work well with together. So Bana, uh, your talk, Pathogenesis of Metabolic Defects of Celiac Disease. So thank you and uh, on to you. Thank you so much, Ritu. Uh, yes, it's really, it has been a great pleasure to work with Ritu since she has joined the cent uh, center. So. <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, discussing with you, uh, wait a second, well, so I'm going to discuss with you pathogenesis of metabolic defects in celiac disease. I think the two talks uh, this morning, uh, the, the two fantastic talks this morning are also a great introduction. Um, Dr. Muir talked to you about uh, tissue healing and the complexity of tissue healing, but the underlying uh, question is, is everything related just, just to the degree of this atrophy? Or is there something else that is also related as Dr. Stappenbeck uh, alluded to, to the remaining epithelial cells that he called atrophic epithelial cells or reparatory epithelial cells that uh, are still there in the presence of this atrophy? Can there be changes there that could explain a variation in clinical phenotypes uh, across patients. And so in this talk, I'm first going to uh, discuss some uh, basic science discoveries in mouse models that always help us to better understand human disease, and then uh, how this led us to rethink uh, about metabolic defects in uh, celiac disease. So uh, one important uh, feature is that uh, uh, we uh, understand now that it is impossible to uh, really understand any pathogenesis or clinical presentation if uh, we don't integrate uh, genetics, immunology, tissue cells, uh, microbial triggers. And I think as I'm going to show you here, it is really important to have this uh, integration. So when we think about the intestine, and again, Dr. Murray uh, alluded to that, we shouldn't be thinking at the intestine as just one organ. Actually, depending on where we are in the intestine, there are very different functions. For instance, there are different functions in the duodenum and the jejunum. Both sides are extremely important for nutrient absorption, but uh, the specific function uh, are not uh, identical and with lipid absorption, for instance, being more important in the G genome. So this also could explain that depending on where healing occurs, uh, you may have uh, different types of consequences uh, when you have uh, remaining damage. The ileum is a very different side that is at the end of the small intestine that's really involved in the absorption of uh, bile acids and uh, lipids. And the colon is a very different site that's mainly uh, playing a role in the absorption of water and ions. And so uh, when we now look at the uh, presence of bacteria, uh, it is classically said and, and true that there is a much stronger bacteria load of commensal bacteria. So we know now that commensal bacteria are part of our whole organism and can play very important roles in health and disease. 
And uh, it is very well known, as I said, that the bacterial load is much uh, greater in the colon than in the small intestine. However, when you look at where the bacteria connect most closely with our tissue cells, and in particular with epithelial cells, it is not in the colon where you have an extremely thick mucus layer, but under physiological condition, it's in the ileum at the end of the small intestine. And you can see a bacteria here really being in close contact uh, with epithelial cells. And what is very interesting is that there is no close interaction between bacteria and the genome. And we believe that one reason this is so is because we have evolved a system to really preserve the metabolic function of the duodenum and the genome that play really a critical role in nutrient absorption. So how can we get at this question of different niches in the intestine how they are regulated and how when there's a dysregulation, this can impact uh, health and disease. So we took advantage of, uh, uh, a, uh, of the finding that a very specific transcription factor that drives uh, duodenal uh, and jejunal identity GATA4 is, uh, can be selectively deleted in the intestinal epithelium. And as you can see here, this transcription factor is selectively expressed in epithelial cells of the duodenum and the jejunum, but it is absent in this lower part of the small intestine that I showed you to be able to interact closely with bacteria. And so when you remove uh, through genetic man manipulation in mice, this transcription factor in epithelial cells, what happens is now the genome becomes ileal-like. So what are the consequences of actually changing intestinal identity uh, along uh, the intestinal tract? So the first observation was that when you remove uh, this transcription factor in mice, now all at a sudden, you see bacteria adhering to the G genome, which you don't see under normal circumstances. And in particular, this is the case of a bacteria that is known to closely adhere to the intestinal epithelium. It's called segmented uh, filamentous uh, bacteria. Normally, it's only present in the ileum, uh, but when you remove GATA4, this is in red, now all of a sudden you see it appearing in the G genome, whereas under normal circumstances, uh, it is uh, absent. So, uh, and again, this is very nicely shown here, where you can see that there are no bacteria, but when you remove GATA4, now all of a sudden you change this interaction. When we now infect mice with a pathogen that normally only uh, colonizes the colon, all of a sudden now, whereas normally it cannot colonize the small intestine, where celiac disease develop, develops, now you can see colonization by this pathogen of the small intestine. And so you can see that just by changing epithelial identity, you completely uh, change the way uh, the microbes uh, colonize our intestine. So what are the consequences of that? So uh, in the context of this mouse model, when you infect with uh, this pathogen called Citrobacter rodentium that uh, uh, resembles uh, pathogenic Escherichia coli in uh, human infections, now all of a sudden you see inflammation in the genome and the ileum, and the mice uh, die, uh, whereas under normal circumstances they don't. And what is more even interesting, and I think important to understand, is that this increased death in mice is dependent on also changes in colonization of what we call this commensal bacteria, the bacteria with whom we live normally, and that can play a, um, a beneficial role in health. Because we change the colonization with this segmented filamentous bacteria that I had shown you uh, before that now colonizes the G genome, only when this commensal bacteria is present is there actually increased death in mice and increased inflammation, meaning that it is very likely that it is the change in how our commensal bacteria colonize the small intestine that is then responsible for the development of a pathogenic immune response uh, that leads to death of the mice 
uh, in uh, the presence of this Citrobacter rodentium. So we tried to understand what could underlie all these changes in immune responses and in bacterial colonization. And what is really inter interesting is that GATA4 is a key transcription factor that drives a number of key metabolic functions uh, in the uh, small intestine, including retinal metabolism and a number of uh, uh, metabolic uh, pathways that are connected to lipid. And we know, for instance, that hypocholesterolemia is part of uh, the celiac uh, disease phenotype. So uh, this changes in metabolism, and I'm not going to show you the uh, data uh, for the sake of time, uh, are actually key in controlling antibody responses in the intestine. And those antibody responses in turn are responsible for controlling bacterial colonization. And this in turn is responsible for these changes in bacterial colonization. So under normal circumstances, when this transcription factor is present, it controls a number of metabolic function, including uh, the vitamin A metabolic pathway. And this helps for uh, the control of commensal bacteria by uh, specific IgA antibody responses. When GATA4 is absent, you alter those metabolic pathways that are lost. And now you can no more control bacterial colonization. And this uh, change in uh, bacterial colonization leads to the development of inflammatory immune responses. But in, when in addition, you get a second hit like a bacterial infection, then uh, you uh, actually develop uh, disease. So this really shows that uh, the program that those epithelial cells have is absolutely key and the presence of GATA4 is actually key in preserving those metabolic functions that then in turn uh, control uh, our uh, response to commensal bacteria and the colonization by commensal bacteria. So how does this apply to celiac disease? So uh, needless to say, you had already uh, a number of introductions, as Dr. Verma indicated in her uh, welcome. Uh, uh, celiac disease is a disease that's um, uh, driven by ingestion of gluten. It has a lot of autoimmune component, and the key features are development of villous atrophy and the presence of antibody uh, directed against uh, transglutaminase 2. So there has always been a question that uh, has not been well resolved in celiac disease. And this is the following. It has been shown that celiac disease and the immune cells that are specific for gluten uh, produce an inflammatory cytokine called interferon gamma uh, and also IL-21 IL that are really in response, that really can mediate, for instance, uh, activation of cytotoxic T cells. And uh, what was always a conundrum in the field is why do you have development of another type of immune response that is called interleukin-17 and normally is really found in the context of response to bacteria. So what I didn't tell you before, uh, again, to simplify a little bit this presentation, is that in absence of GATA4, the dysregulated immune response we, show, we see in mice is an increase, for instance, in interleukin-17 immune responses that are, for instance, targeted against commensal bacteria that now develop in the upper small intestine. What the group of uh, Ludwig Solid and Knut Lundin uh, had shown is that in celiac disease, the cells that produce the cytokine called interleukin-17 that is known to play a pathogenic role in psoriasis, uh, that this uh, response is not directed against gluten. And so how is it that you have an increase in this interleukin-17 T cell response if those immune cells are not specific for gluten? So you may, may uh, maybe anticipate the question I'm going to ask based on our discovery in the mouse model, which is, could it be that in celiac disease, there is a change in the transcription and the functional program in epithelial cells, such as that GATA4 expression is lost, and that this changes bacterial colonization and may promote a uh, immune response 
uh, AL17 immune response that normally would not be found under normal circumstances. So the first thing we did by uh, performing a transcriptional profiling in more than 100 individuals is that indeed the IL-17 pathway is increased in active celiac disease uh, as was reported uh, by several groups. And uh, this increase in IL-17 only takes place when there is an active celiac disease, but we know it is not gluten specific but it is gluten dependent, meaning that in the context of uh, inflammation induced by gluten, there is something that changes that promotes this IL-17 immune response that is then reverted when patients go on a gluten-free diet. What was extremely interesting to us was that in addition to having this increase in IL-17 immune responses, as uh, anticipated uh, in the mouse model, there's also a decrease in this retinol, in this vitamin A pathway that uh, I alluded to earlier. And what was really exciting is that indeed we could see a decrease in GATA4 expression, not only at the gene level, but as you can see here, also at the protein level. I want to draw your attention to the fact that, that GATA4 expression has a wide distribution. So some patients have normal levels, like in controls, and other patients have very low levels. And this again translates at the protein level. This is immunohistochemistry. You see that this, both patients have the same degree of villus atrophy. Here, GATA4 is absent. Here, GATA4 is present. So this goes to the concept I was discussing earlier, which is independently of the degree of villus atrophy. Could it be that the epithelial cells that line the damaged gut, that are the atrophic epithelial cells that uh, Dr. Stappenbeck alluded to, could it be that there is variation in the gene expression and functional program of those uh, cells across celiac disease patients? And could that explain heterogeneity in presentation of metabolic defects, but also of immune responses uh, in uh, celiac disease patients. So uh, what we did is we separated patients in GATA4 high and GATA4 low patients. And you can see that there is a correlation between the loss of the retinal pathway and uh, the uh, loss of GATA4 expression. Conversely, we only see an increase in IL-17 in the patients that lost GATA4, and again, there is a correlation. And very interestingly, what we also see is uh, based on a proxy for Willis to crypto ratio is the, uh, that the severity of Willis atrophy seems also to be connected uh, to the presence or absence of GATA4. So when uh, we analyzed in collaboration with Rastamis Magilov, the bacterial profile, it was not that there there was a, a very big difference in the bacterial load in uh, celiac patients and in control. So, and this is exactly what we saw in the mouse model of GATA4 deficiency. But rather, we see that there are some differences in certain bacteria in how they uh, adhere to the epithelium. Furthermore, as I also alluded to, but here I'm showing to you in a more global way, there were profound changes in um, uh, metabolic pathways, lipid catabolic pathway, fatty acid metabolism, retinol metabolism uh, that uh, are really present uh, in the patients that have uh, loss of GATA4. And so what was even more important is, is that we only saw this defect in metabolic pathways uh, bile acid metabolism, HEM, you know that some patients have anemia and others don't, fatty acid metabolism, and again, the immune pathway IL-17, uh, uh, but not interferon gamma, were only altered in GATA4 low patients in the presence of this particular commensal bacteria. And importantly, those metabolic pathways were not altered in presence of actinobacillus in controls. And we could further show that at the end, the IL-17 increase required both things, a change in GATA4 expression and the presence of this uh, commensal bacteria. 
And so I, I do believe that when we think about the presentation of celiac disease, when we think about healing, when we think about the spectrum, both in healing, in the presence or absence of metabolic pathways in celiac disease patients, we shouldn't just be looking at the degree of villus atrophy. Uh, because again, those two patients have the same degree of virus atrophy, GATA4 is expressed here, GATA4 is not expressed here, and we know now that this is associated with profound alteration in metabolic pathways in these patients, but not in, that, in those patients. And Again, this goes. Uh, this is in line with a number of observations where people uh, have reported that uh, it is not so much the degree of villus atrophy that is linked to hypercholesterolemia, anemia, uh, vitamin deficiency, and we had a poor understanding of what may be driving it. And what I would like to propose today is that what we need now to understand in relationship also to what Dr. Stappenbeck has discussed, is that we should be analyzing not only the degree of villus atrophy, but the functional program of those epithelial cells in conjunction with the presence or absence uh, of certain uh, bacteria. And so it is really important to perform studies that integrate epithelial physiology, microbiome, uh, and immune responses. And this goes more generally I think uh, where we stand in the field, where there was a time where uh, all the efforts were in discovering one gene, one bacteria, and understanding cause-effect relationships. And while this has been critical in advancing our understanding, uh, our basic understanding of how uh, uh, the physiological system and the uh, human physiology, we know that this has not been sufficient to understand and treat complex disorders, in particular complex immune disorders. We are now at an era where we are ready to embrace that complexity and to integrate not only microbiology, immunology, genetics, but actually to really integrate all those fields together to really get an understanding of the complexity of the disease, of the spectrum of disease, and uh, uh, based on those observations and finding to guide uh, our treatments uh, and uh, patient follow-up. And so I just wanted to share with you uh, the really uh, fantastic news where in collaboration with our wonderful collaborator, Dr. Joe Murray at the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Rastamis Magilov at Caltech, who works on the microbiome, uh, we have obtained a what uh, NIDDK calls a high impact interdisciplinary science grant that is uh, starting this year, where we will be doing interventional challenge and de-challenge in celiac disease patients to really get an, at an understanding of what uh, is what are the mechanisms that induce tissue healing and tissue damage. But in the context of this uh, proposal, we are also going to generate a lot of data that will be available to the community at large to conduct uh, further studies. So, uh, uh, this work was conducted by uh, two fantastic graduate students, uh, Zachary Early and Viola Luziska, uh, that uh, Zachary is now a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF, Viola is still in the laboratory. We had uh, uh, wonderful collaborators, computational com collaborators in the, uh, uh, with Samantha Riesenfeld and the Luis Barrero lab. And this really speaks to the interdisciplinary nature of the University of Chicago. We have, of course, fantastic physicians uh, with whom we collaborate very uh, closely. And I, I want to especially thank here Sonia Köpfer. And then we have uh, uh, our collaborators with Rastem Ismagilov and Valente uh, Disepolo. And as I said, Joe Murray, uh, who is participating his and all his group in the RC2 grant. And of course, I want to thank uh, the celiac disease center, the celiac disease patients and their families with whom we could not be uh, conducting those studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bana. This was uh, great, uh, of course. Uh, I think the next speaker on our list is uh, is Dawn Adams. Uh, uh, she is uh, 
currently an associate professor of medicine at Vanderbilt uh, University, where she is uh, spearheading the new Select Disease Center at uh, Vanderbilt. So, please, Dr. Don Adams, metabolic defects in Select Disease before and after gluten free diet. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate being invited to give this talk today and to follow those excellent presentations. I'm going to take it a little bit back to the clinical side and discuss the metabolic defects that happen before and after a gluten-free diet. This is the outline, and I do not have any disclosures today. Easiest way to look at um, body composition on a population-based level is to look at BMI, and there's been several studies reporting BMI distribution and changes in celiac patients at diagnosis and gluten-free diet. Classically, the presentation of the underweight celiac disease patient, as we all know, is not necessarily the most predominant um, way we're going to be seeing our patients. And in fact, this has been shown in multiple studies. Um, this here is a study out of the U.S. that was comparing patients uh, before gluten-free diet, after gluten-free diet, and then comparing it to a control population drawn from the NHANES data in the U.S. And you can see here both in women and in men especially, um, it's actually more likely to be underweight in someone with uh, out celiac disease than those with celiac disease. And in fact, patients with celiac disease are more likely to present with a normal BMI than that of the general population. And you can see here, we do still have patients presenting and maintaining at obese and um, overweight levels. This holds true with children as well who tend to present in a normal BMI distribution. Another, again, this is population-based data. What happens to an individual patient um, after they're diagnosed with celiac disease, both before and after gluten-free diet? Um, this flowchart here is combining a US study and a Finnish study um, looking at BMI changes. And you can see that majority of patients still are presenting in normal weight. Um, but of those that start with an underweight, many of them will normalize to a normal weight. Um, and interestingly, of those that start at overweight or obese, some of them will normalize to an overweight. Um, to a normal weight, and some will actually drop weight from obese to overweight. And so there is a different um, physiology that happens in patients, and not everyone is following the pattern of weight gain following gluten-free diet. Now, if we want to dive deeper into the actual composition as opposed to just the weight, um, this is a study done um, out of the Italian group who does a lot of the research um, that has been published on body composition and metabolic rate in celiac disease. Um, this was looking at about 39 patients with celiac disease, both before and after gluten-free diet, and comparing it to control subjects. And what's interesting here, we again see that patients are um, presenting at a lower weight with untreated celiac disease. But interestingly, it's really the fat um, percent fat mass and total fat that is suffering in celiac disease. And um, so these were significantly lower in untreated patients, um, as well as fat-free mass. But when these patients were on a gluten-free diet for 12 months, which is most notable here, is that fat-free mass in women really doesn't change much, and in men also doesn't change much. Um, but the fat mass is where we're seeing these weight gains. Um, another metabolic study looking at waist circumference, which can be a marker of central adiposity and metabolic risk factors, also found that patients were increasing their waist circumference by about three centimeters after about 12 months on a gluten-free diet, which was statistically significant and can be medically, clinically significant as well. Do patients with celiac disease have much change in their energy expenditure? Um, it would be interesting to hypothesize, perhaps that's part of what's going on both before and after gluten-free diet. Um, a lot of energy expenditure does depend upon one's fat-free mass. And as mentioned from that previous study, we don't see much change in fat-free mass. We do know that in some disease states, inflammation can raise energy expenditure, but we also know that chronic starvation or chronic uh, malabsorption due to st studies done in anorexia um, or Minnesota starvation studies can actually lower energy expenditure. And so there's not very many studies that have looked at energy expenditure um, in patients with celiac disease. I'm not sure how familiar you all are with measuring this, but um, this is an indirect calorimeter. This is actually my dietitians testing out a new machine um, and one way to re measure resting energy expenditure is to measure um, oxygen consumed and carbon dioxide expelled to get a rate. So in this study, um, looking at patients, this is the same study that looked at the percent of fat and fat-free mass, um, also looked at changes in um, resting energy expenditure. 
Overall, patients with celiac did have mildly increased resting energy expenditure, although it was not statistically significantly different from controls nor after the gluten-free diet. Um, what did change was the respiratory quotient, and this makes sense. Um, when your respiratory quotient is higher, um, you're tending to metabolize more carbohydrates as compared to lipids. In patients in celiac disease, if there is fat malabsorption, they will have a higher respiratory quotient, and this was found in this study and improved over time with gluten-free diet. This correlated well with fecal lipid loss um, that was also measured. And as discussed, there was not much change in fat-free mass, and nitrogen balance does not seem to change too much in patients both before and after gluten-free diet. Can some of this change be due to um, hormonal changes and in food intake? Um, we do know two of the major hormones that modulate um, satiety, adipose, um, sorry, leptin released from adipose tissue and ghrelin released from stomach have been looked at. Um, not much change in leptin in patients with celiac disease pre or post gluten-free diet when normalized for BMI. Um, ghrelin, however, has been shown to be higher in patients um, with untreated celiac disease before gluten-free diet. Um, and this figure here is demonstrating that, so commonly ghrelin is, um, it's well known to inversely correlate with someone's BMI, so you must normalize that when reporting. And these dark circles here represent for gluten-free diet that open squares after, and you can see a distribution here with higher levels of ghrelin for BMI pre-gluten-free diet. There's also some changes on gastric motility, um, of course, which could affect appetite and possibly modulate fat intake. Um, and we do see that patients with celiac disease have slower gastric emptying rates that improve but don't necessarily normalize after gluten-free diet. Um, this hasn't directly correlated with ghrelin levels and could be related to inflammation um, that is affecting the autonomic nervous system. Moving on to micronutrients, um, there has been numerous publications on levels of micronutrient deficiencies in celiac disease, and this is a, a well-known topic that's discussed with patients, both by physicians and clinicians. Um, I tried to summarize some of the larger meta-analyses and um, summary texts that are out there, and not just report the levels of deficiencies, both pre- and post-gluten-free diet, but I think it's also just important to put it in perspective of where celiac patients in relation to the general population. So in these tables, I've also included that as a control deficiency to the best of our knowledge that we, we can extract. And this is mostly from um, US populations. Um, B12 is commonly um, deficient at diagnosis um, due to likely interactions with pancreatic insufficiency and difficulties with some of the protein bindings that can be deficient. Um, this classically will improve with gluten-free diet and actually is lower than controls. And I, I think part of this is because we're checking it and supplementing these patients more frequently than might be happening in control populations. Folic acid is extremely important in, um, in um, human metabolism and is commonly low in celiac disease. And folate is unique because it's also low in about one out of five patients with celiac disease well controlled on a gluten-free diet. Um, and this is despite bilis um, atrophy resolution and healing of what we see in the duodenum where bile is predominantly absorbed. And this likely is due to lack of intake, possibly due to lack of cereals that are fortified with folic acid in the gluten-free diet. Um, similar findings in B6, which overall in general is a low vitamin deficiency in the general population. And then vitamin D, of course, is, is quite a hot topic vitamin um, in the past several years and is shown to be very high um, deficiency in patients with celiac disease. Interestingly, um, vitamin D metabolism, you might actually have high levels of 125, the activated version of vitamin D in patients with celiac disease due to the elevated parathyroid hormone and activation of this. So depending on how you're measuring this, in untreated patients, you might get um, different levels, but overall vitamin D levels are thought to be low. Um, after treatment, this actually approaches that of the general population, which tends to also suffer from a pretty significant vitamin D deficiency. Minerals, um, iron, obviously one of the most common deficiencies in celiac disease, and in fact um, is a deficiency that will lead to diagnosis of celiac disease for many patients. Um, this is reported up to 80% of patients presenting with iron deficiency. And again, just like folic acid, this is likely due to its very high absorption in the areas of the duodenum that's affected by celiac disease. 
Um, patients usually will respond to gluten-free diet. Um, reported levels of iron deficiency after treated celiac disease approaches that of the general population. Calcium deficiency, I really struggle with. Um, you really cannot use serum calcium as a marker of total body calcium, yet some reports try to use this as a marker of calcium deficiency. Um, as you all may know, that you really need to look at overall bone storage, and there are more advanced um, diagnostic tests you can try to do to estimate calcium levels, but using a serum calcium is not a good marker of total body calcium. And so I think it's really a question mark um, how, how prevalent this is for, for patients with celiac disease also, and in general in the control population. And again, we're not referring to intake, we're referring to whole body stores here. But we do know that there is definitely a malabsorption of calcium and patients are very much likely suffering from a total body calcium deficiency, which we'll also discuss with bone um, discussion in the next few slides. Um, magnesium deficiency also is reported, and that is um, as expected with diarrhea. Um, again, magnesium deficiency like calcium, however, I do struggle with these numbers um, because it's very difficult to measure total body magnesium based on a serum magnesium. Um, some of the studies that have been published citing about up to 20% of patients with celiac disease being low in magnesium um, do look at magnesium load and urinary excretion tests, which are better markers, um, but commonly it's just reported as serum magnesium. And just like folic acid, magnesium is not supplemented or fortified in some of the gluten-free products and may also lead to the high prevalence of deficiency in those on gluten-free diet. Zinc deficiency typically will respond as just with most diarrheal illnesses with less cell turnover with treatment of disease. So how do some of those vitamins play a role in um, uh, systemic complications? Um, specifically looking at some of the B vitamins, we talked about B12, folic acid, and B6. Um, these play a very important role in homocysteine uh, remethylation and transsulfuration to lower homocysteine levels. Um, and we have, from many studies, out, even outside of celiac disease, it's very well known that homocysteine is associated with certain inflammatory conditions and can lead to cardiovascular disease, recurrent pregnancy loss, and bone disease. And specifically, it interacts with nitric oxide pathways and increases reactive oxygen species and important signaling pathways specifically in the endothelial um, system that leads to some of this inflammation. Patients with celiac disease have been shown to have higher levels of homocysteine has, and has been shown in multiple studies. Um, here's just one example here um, where low levels of homocysteine um, improve after the gluten-free diet. So when we think about homocysteine, again, it's commonly talked about in uh, cardiovascular risk. And I've commented on some other um, cardiovascular risks that might change with gluten-free diet. And so cardiovascular risk is a, is a big topic um, as we think about our patients and their, and their longitudinal care um, on gluten-free diet. So on one hand, um, you know, untreated celiac disease is associated with less weight, less fat. Um, also, as Dr. Jabri commented on, patients with celiac disease have lower cholesterol levels. Um, and maybe some of this is protective from cardiovascular disease. As patients are on a gluten-free diet, um, that diet itself may be less heart-friendly, and we also mentioned this increase in weight and fat mass. Patients with celiac disease that are on a gluten-free diet do have an improvement in cholesterol, specifically increased though in HDL, possibly due to improvement in apolipoprotein and the enterocytes, but also due to fat absorption. There's also been studies commenting on increase in blood pressure with um, patients jumping from normal tensive to hypertensive categories after gluten-free diet at a significant level. And so how does this all play a role in the development of cardiovascular disease? Um, there have been some population-based studies, specifically um, Dr. Ludvigsen's studies out of Sweden that show significant increased risk in patients with celiac disease suffering from cardiovascular death or ischemic heart disease. And this was noted at a hazard ratio of about 1.19. Um, and this was um, statistically significant and of clinical significance, of course, to our patients um, as we discuss with them how they're doing their diet long-term um, to manage their celiac disease. 
So overall, there seems to be increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and it's likely a um, complex interaction of these metabolic changes that are happening after a gluten-free diet. Um, moving on to bone health, um, we do know that patients with celiac disease, um, newly diagnosed premenopausal celiac patients have higher rates of both osteopenia and osteoporosis as compared to that of the general population. And um, this actually translates to an increased fracture risk with a hazard ratio of about 1.4, which is always important to, to discuss when we're talking about bone health in general. Um, this is, a, is probably just more than malabsorption. This is a schematic um, trying to outline all the possible interactions that are happening leading to metabolic bone disease. Of course, malabsorption of calcium and vitamin D are very important um, and are due to inflammation and villus atrophy. This, of course, leads to a secondary hyperparathyroidism, which leads to bone turnover. As I mentioned with vitamin D, um, it also leads to an increased hydroxylation of vitamin D to 125-hydroxy-D. And in the setting of lack of calcium absorption, high levels of 125-hydroxy-D can actually be detrimental to bone um, as it really depends on that enterocyte absorption of calcium that it normally is stimulating. In addition, um, we have high inflammatory markers. Um, and we have a high level of rank ligand to OPG, um, which is a known um, ratio that can actually lead to the development and maturation of osteoclasts, again, leading to increased bone breakdown. Patients with celiac also have low weight and malnutrition and have reported hypogonadism, which are also known risk factors for metabolic bone disease. What happens to bone disease after a gluten-free diet? Well, we do know in children, actually, they do quite well. And um, many studies have reported complete reversal of bone loss in children from six months to two years. Um, unfortunately, this recovery diminishes with age. And so patients presenting at older age may have less improvement in their bone density. There's been many studies looking at changes in bone density after a gluten-free diet. Um, this one here was looking at changes both one in the dark black boxes and five in the light gray boxes years after gluten-free diet. And you can see here most of this bone um, reversal, this is a change from baseline, so these are all improvements. Most of this is happening within a year of gluten-free diet. Um, this population here with women did have some postmenopausal women, and so there was some expected bone loss that occurred um, over time. We do know that these inflammatory cytokines and this rank L to OPG ratio are decreasing over time with the gluten-free diet, but it has been shown that patients with celiac disease might still have higher levels of osteoclast activation than those um, without celiac disease. And so it's important to acknowledge kind of who is gonna respond to the gluten-free diet alone um, in terms of bone disease. And this is one of the um, major um, clinical markers that we discuss with our patients and one of the outcomes specifically with fracture risk that we discuss when we talk about the importance of mucosal recovery. So what to do with the bone disease? Um, I mean, obviously this whole bone disease could be a discussion in itself. Um, everyone agrees bone health is an issue, um, but there are different guidelines from the societies about how exactly to address bone health. I and mean, so specifically what labs should be drawn, um, you know, some people just draw vitamin D, but there is probably a role for looking at parathyroid hormone, alkaline phosphatase, maybe vitamin D 125 in that first year and deciding whether or not you should be aggressive with supplementation, but also magnesium and vitamin K, which we know can be low in patients with celiac disease and are important in bone health. Um, when to do the diagnostic test, both the DEXA scan, um, some societies call for early DEXA scan, others due to that data showing complete river or improved bone density within a year proposed to wait a year, but likely it's a combination of assessing the risks of your patient. For example, postmenopausal female already really low weight, likely already has a pretty low bone density and might need sooner analysis and treatment. Um, when to start lifestyle and over-the-counter supplements in general, you know, these are usually pretty benign, 
Um, but discussing this with our patients and the importance of these. And then of course, when referral or treatment with more advanced medications for metabolic bone disease. Um, we discussed these four major categories, and I know it was a little bit of a whirlwind, um, but just to echo Dr. Jabri's talk, um, after gluten-free diet, these things don't necessarily go back to normal. And so even though villus atrophy may have resolved, we still are seeing that our patients with celiac disease are suffering from metabolic complications that could be affecting specific long-term outcomes like cardiovascular disease and bone health. And so I do think there's a call um, to better understand what's happening um, at the metabolic level uh, under the microscope and in the clinic and how we might tailor diets more specifically um, early on in treatment to adjust this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Uh, this has been very, very enlightening. Thank you. And we'll move on to our last but not the least speaker, uh, Dr. Marisa Stahl. She is our research director at the uh, Colorado Center for Celiac Disease and an assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, she's also the director of research and does a lot of research and her interests have been many, uh, though I do believe that screening, whether it's in general pediatrics or in at-risk population has definitely always been close to our heart. Today, however, we are going to talk about the childhood growth and celiac disease and I do want to know, do the children really grow into celiac disease? Looking forward to your talk, Dr. Stahl. Thank you so much for the introduction and to the organizers of this symposia for inviting me to give this talk. I know I'm the last talk uh, between discussion and break, so I'll make sure to stick to my time. Um, but I will be speaking today on childhood growth and celiac disease and commenting on whether um, do children grow into celiac disease and do they catch up? And here are my uh, disclosures, none of which are related to my talk today. So in this talk, I'm going to review the celiac disease rela related impacts on childhood growth. I'm going to highlight the observed growth changes um, associated with celiac disease autoimmunity in our Colorado birth cohort study, the diabetes autoimmunity study in the young. And finally, I'm going to discuss some of the implications of growth impact on pediatric celiac disease clinical care. First, a little bit of background on celiac disease and growth. So celiac disease is a gluten-induced immune-mediated um, enteropathy that may lead to villus blunting, and it is this small intestinal inflammation um, that we typically think of as leading to the classic gastrointestinal manifestations, malabsorption, diarrhea, weight loss. Um, and in fact, as part of this constellation of malabsorptive symptoms, growth failure in the past has often been associated with classic celiac disease. Um, however, the exact mechanism of growth impairment remains unknown. Um, it is thought to be due to either um, or a combination of malabsorption, alterations of the growth hormone access, or the inflammatory milieu of celiac disease. Um, and as Dr. Ver Dr. Verma alluded to at the start of this symposium, the spectrum of celiac disease presentation has changed. And now a majority of children actually have non-classic or asymptomatic presentations, and really less is known about how growth is affected with these presentations. Um, and overall, when you look at the literature, um, particularly at longitudinal growth effects, um, the literature is overall conflicting. And so getting back to that mechanism of growth impacts and the questions that may be raised from that, um, the point of this slide is definitely not to detail the immunology of celiac disease. Um, I just wanted to emphasize the sequela of celiac disease pathogenesis and kind of where antibody formation and detectable autoimmunity um, falls into this sequela. And so this slide is definitely an oversimplification, but what I want you to take away from this is that there are many steps in the autoimmune and inflammatory process that may occur 
prior to that last box of detectable autoantibody formation. And this really becomes um, central to a question that I will talk more about on later slides um, that we tried to address with our Colorado uh, birth cohort screening data. And that is, can growth differences precede celiac disease uh, seroconversion or essentially like do children grow into celiac disease? And so while that hints at the malabsorptive and inflammatory mechanisms of growth impairment, um, the other important aspect of growth impacts in celiac disease is the growth hormone access. And growth hormone is secreted from the pituitary gland in a pulsatile fashion. It acts in many locations, but mainly in the liver and the um, epiphyseal plates in the long bones and spine with respect to its function in skeletal growth. Um, and in studies of the growth hormone access, particularly in celiac disease, um, we have found both states of what appear to be growth hormone deficiency with lower levels of growth hormone and growth hormone resistance with higher levels. And then lower levels of downstream signaling, including IGF-1, IGF-2, and IGF-BP3 have also been found, which can also be indicative of growth hormone resistance or of malnourished states. And so I think what becomes very complicated at the time of celiac disease diagnosis is that it can be really difficult to differentiate whether there is a true concurrent growth hormone deficiency or whether some of these observed changes are just due to growth hormone access alterations from malnutrition or inflammation that will ultimately resolve with treatment. Um, so what is known about the clinical scenarios we see with respect to growth in celiac disease? One very common clinical scenario is growth failure at presentation. So what is known about this in the literature? Well, actually, um, we've seen that with increased awareness and decreased diagnostic delay, um, there has actually been a decrease in the prevalence of growth failure at diagnosis. Um, we've also seen that growth failure may be more common in younger children at diagnosis, um, males, and may also correlate with the severity of villus atrophy. Um, a big aspect of looking at growth failure in pediatrics is what parameters are you examining? Because um, prevalence of growth failure may be different based on what you're actually looking at. And what I mean by this is you may be looking at a child's BMI and tracking that, and that may actually be normal if they are equally stunted in terms of their weight and their height. So we get the most valuable information when we look at all of these parameters. Um, with that said, it's still relatively common within celiac disease, and some studies show that as many as 10% of children may have short stature at the time of diagnosis. Um, and there was also a, a very nice study done at the University of Chicago that showed that these rates actually may vary by country. Um, another very common clinical scenario is counseling a child with short stature at diagnosis um, as to how catch-up growth will look on a gluten-free diet. And I think this is one of the most difficult things I see in clinic because um, the studies have also been somewhat mixed on this. But what we do know from the literature is that there are very variable periods of catch-up growth cited. So some studies look at six months, some studies look at six years. Um, some studies have actually shown that catch-up growth um, correlates well with the recovery of that growth hormone access. Um, Overall, when you look at the literature, most prepubertal children will experience catch-up growth, although that catch-up growth can be incomplete, particularly when you look at um, parameters of skeletal growth. Um, some studies show that catch-up growth may be dependent on the age of diagnosis, although some studies show that that's not the case. Um, and then, as alluded to on the other slide, poor catch-up growth may also be due to concurrent growth hormone um, deficiency, and that can be really, really difficult to tease out. <laughs> 
Um, and then another thing that clinicians must be aware of that I'm so happy that Dr. Adams brought up as well is that not all children with untreated celiac disease are malnourished. Um, and there is more emerging data to say that it is becoming increasingly common for children to be overweight or obese at the time of their celiac disease diagnosis. And what I found in the literature is that actually it's it's still less prevalent to have obesity um, in children with celiac disease than without, but it certainly exists and is prevalent. Um, and there may be differences um, in that prevalence based on country and gender. Um, classic symptoms may be less common in this patient population. And then as Dr. Adams pointed out, one point that I find so fascinating is that obesity commonly improves on a gluten-free diet. Um, and then finally, what about the question that I posed earlier? Um, what does growth look like for children with celiac disease well before the development of autoimmunity? What does longitudinal growth look like? Um, and really, there have only been six studies that have used longitudinal data on growth in celiac disease. Um, and some, but not all of these studies, show that celiac disease and early growth are associated. Um, overall, there were four studies um, that are listed on this slide that did find growth differences among children that develop celiac disease or celiac disease autoimmunity. But what you will see in all of these different studies is that there's a lot of variability as to how those children were identified, whether they had a clinical diagnosis or if they were identified because of screening and how frequently TTG was monitored in these studies. Um, and then there are also variable periods of follow-up. Um, and not all longitudinal growth studies showed that there was a difference in growth prior to clinically or screen-detected celiac disease. And this slide lists two studies that actually did not find a difference. So something that became very interesting to us was do growth differences precede seroconversion and are there celiac disease impacts, um, growth impacts before we can actually detect autoimmunity? And so I'm going to um, shift gears now and talk briefly about the data from Colorado regarding longitudinal growth in patients with celiac disease. Um, from the DAISY study. And so the DAISY or Diabetes Autoimmunity Study in the Young is a prospective uh, birth cohort study um, in Colorado that started in 1993. It includes two different groups of children, um, newborns who are at increased risk for celiac disease or type 1 diabetes based on HLA, um, and then um, unaffected uh, family members of patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, and these children were periodically screened for celiac disease with TTG IgA, and they had very frequent follow-up um, to collect data on anthropometrics, diet, puberty, family history, and other potential exposures. So this slide here is just a schematic of what I showed you on the previous slide. Um, but what it shows in the first box is the group of children that were recruited into DAISY. And once again, that was newborns based on the listed HLAs um, and first degree relatives of patients with type 1 diabetes. The middle box shows the data and samples collected at follow-up, including the blood samples for autoantibody screening, um, food frequency questionnaires, exposure data, medical and family history, growth data. And then the box on the right um, shows the outcomes that were followed in DAISY. Our primary outcome was persistent TTG IgA positivity or celiac disease autoimmunity, um, which was based on a positive um, screen on two consecutive samples at least um, three months apart. And then celiac disease was the secondary outcome based either on biopsy or high antibody levels. And so um, in this particular analysis, we were able to include 1,979 children who had periodic serologic um, screening and growth data. Um, and 120 of those children developed celiac disease autoimmunity and 71 developed celiac disease. 
And these are the results um, from our study. What we found is that actually most growth parameters were not different before zero conversion. And that's shown on the forest plot on this slide. Um, what you can see are the hazard ratios from our joint model looking at the risk of celiac disease autoimmunity in the top rows um, and celiac disease in those bottom rows um, based on growth parameters prior to zero conversion. Um, there was only one significant finding, and you'll see that um, next to height Z score for celiac disease. Um, and what we found was that um, in our adjusted model for an increase in height Z score, there was interestingly and surprisingly a 28% increased risk of subsequently developing celiac disease. And so what we concluded from this is that most growth measures prior to zero conversion were not associated with later risk of celiac disease autoimmunity or celiac disease. And so what follows that is that perhaps the negative consequences on growth from a later diagnosis can be averted with periodic screening. Um, and it also suggests for the previous positive studies that I showed you, um, it may have been that previous observed growth differences were more tied to a posse symptomatic period in those that were clinically detected um, or undetected autoimmunity. Um, we were surprised to find this increased uh, height change rate prior to zero conversion that was associated with later celiac disease. Although this finding does mirror some studies on growth and islet autoimmunity, um, and it'll be interesting to look at this relationship in other birth cohort studies to see if it actually holds. So while we may screen some children in at-risk populations, um, clinically, we are very rarely screening for celiac disease as frequently as the DAISY study. So let's talk about some clinical scenarios we may actually see more frequently. Um, and so once again, can we predict which children will actually catch up with respect to their growth? And the results from current studies are very mixed on this. Um, the figure on this slide is from um, Jemmy's study um, that shows that while kids certainly experienced growth um, up to four years after their diagnosis, um, none of the children in this particular study actually experience complete catch-up growth. And that's most obvious with the squares on this figure, which represents height. However, there are some other studies that suggest catch-up growth is complete for everyone and is independent of age at diagnosis, diagnostic delay, or gluten-free diet adherence. Um, so we really can't predict who will catch up. Um, what I will say is that pubertal and post-pubertal children are less likely to catch up. Um, and so with mixed results, what do I personally tell my patients with short stature? Um, I'm honest that we, we really can't tell, and some children do experience catch-up growth and some do not, and only time will really tell. Um, and we don't have a good way of predicting who will catch up. So I tell them we're gonna watch closely and if they're not improving after a year on the gluten-free diet, um, I typically will refer to endocrine just to make sure that there aren't other things contributing to their short stature. Which brings me to when should we refer to endocrinology outside of, you know, if they're not experiencing catch-up growth after a year. So there are other times that I will more immediately refer to endocrinology, and that um, oftentimes has to do with the child's proximity to puberty, because there's only a very defined window of when they can get growth hormone treatment. Um, if they've been screened and have a low IGF-1 and IGF-BP3, delayed bone age, um, delayed height velocity, signs of growth hormone deficiency, then I will refer. So just a couple of examples of patients that I have seen that have either caught up or not caught up. This was a patient who was diagnosed at age nine. They were picked up in the TEDI study, which is another um, prospective birth cohort study, just due to routine screening. Um, they did have a little bit of slowed growth velocity um, and did experience, as you can see, complete catch-up growth on the gluten-free diet. 
Um, but that certainly doesn't happen every time. And this is a child who was diagnosed at age four in workup for short stature. Um, and they're continuing to be followed by endocrine. They have a normal bone age, normal growth velocity, normal IGF-1 and IGF-BP3 um, and still haven't caught up. And this is another patient who hasn't caught up yet. They um, were diagnosed at seven and they had some poor weight gain and anemia and their TTG has normalized and haven't had catch up growth yet. So they're getting referred to endocrine. Um, so in conclusion, I said I'd review the celiac disease related impacts on growth. And I think growth impairment is a well-described manifestation of celiac disease and catch-up growth commonly occurs in children um, on the gluten-free diet, but it's not always complete. Um, I said I would talk to you about our results from the DAISY study. And what we found is that overall growth differences were not observed prior to serial conversion. Um, and then I said I would discuss the implications for celiac disease clinical care. Um, and I think one major impact of earlier diagnosis for celiac disease may be improved growth. Um, and another very important take home is that it's hard to predict who will have complete catch up growth um, and who will not. So in conclusion, I think children both grow into and catch, um, catch up in celiac disease. And I just wanted to take this slide to thank my team um, here at the Colorado Center for Celiac Disease and all of our collaborators um, in the DAISY study and the DAISY participants. Thank you, Dr. Stahl. Uh, I guess I can see that celiac children will grow into celiac disease most of the time. So thank you. I think at this time, we'll invite all of our speakers to join for the uh, panel discussion. Uh, there's one person who will be joining who was not part of the uh, talks, and that's Dr. Ann Lee. Um, so I'd love to welcome her. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Dr. Lee is an assistant professor of um, nutritional medicine in the Department of Medicine and Institute for Human Nutrition at Columbia University, and she is the dietitian for the Celiac Disease Center. So welcome, Dr. Lee. Um, it's really yeah. a pleasure that you've been able to join us from New York. Um, and uh, Dr. London, would you like to start off with the questions um, for the panel? Uh, maybe uh, just a question to you, Rita, as well. We have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, uh, should we start with those? Is that the idea? I'm not so sure. I would, I would say we should. And I think the first question was about the 17-year-old. Yeah. And uh, maybe Dr. Lee, you, we can start with you. Um, sure. There was a question, and I'm sure yeah. once the diagnosis is made, and then they are, everyone's handed over to you to help with the treatment. Mm. Um, and uh, there's a concern for the 17 year old still not doing well. And what can we do for gut recovery? Mm. A couple things that we need to always look at when we think of gut recovery is is not just are they on the diet, but what is the quality of their diet. So we need to assure that they are indeed as each of our speakers have, have noted today, that the importance of recovery is based on being on the gluten-free diet. So we need to assess that they're doing a good job on it. But then we also need to assess um, the, the real quality of that diet. It has been, has been noted in many of the speakers today too, that the quality of the gluten-free diet tends to be poor. Many of the products are not fortified or enriched back to their pre-processed standard. Many of the packaged and processed, po processed products are also higher fat, higher sugar, lower fiber, and devoid of any whole grain. So that we then end up missing those key nutrients that, that Dawn talked about. We're missing folate, we're missing you know, our calcium, so that we really need to look at that quality. And we actually end up spending a lot of time with our, our PEDS patients in particular, on really making sure that they're not just grabbing the snacks out of the vending machine, they're not just drinking a soda, that we're really getting those nutrients in. Um, and then we reassess to see, you know, once they've been on a quality gluten-free diet for a while, that we then watch their markers and watch their growth to see if we're making any changes. May, may I also add a question to the panelists? In this case, the, the uh, uh, endurance athlete, uh, uh, are we confident that he is on a gluten-free diet 
and this is Joe here, I would be pretty confident that they're not. Mm. Uh, with the continued TTG still quite elevated after three years at 70, the continued iron deficiency certainly suggests that there is continued damage within the proximal small intestine, unless the patient is a vegan, for example, or on a very low iron intake. Um, I would be very concerned that this indicates a high likelihood that the patient is still getting gluten and sufficient gluten to damage the intestine. And of course, the, the next question there relates also, Joe, would you advocate a rebiopsy in this case? I should be cautious. If this was an adult, I probably would, um, but this is not. I mean, this is a, a, um, a young patient, um, and I would defer to my pediatric colleagues. But I think if I was faced with an adult patient with such as continued strong positive TTG and symptoms, I think we'd be really safe to assume that the patient is getting gluten, even without a follow-up biopsy. Mm. Maybe we could have Dr. Stahl weigh in as the pediatric representative. Yeah, would love to. I, I agree with Dr. Murray here. I don't think we really need a biopsy to tell us that there's ongoing gluten exposures. And my focus would be more having them meet with our dietitian and really dive into where there may be some potential exposures. Um, because I don't think that putting them through an endoscopy would necessarily yield a lot more light in this situation. I can also just add with these um, high endurance athletes, they take a lot of supplements um, and products that definitely could either be contaminated with gluten, um, not properly regulated. Um, also, just consuming the amount of calories they need. And if they're consuming a lot of what are labeled gluten free products and just massive amounts, I think there's a lot of room um, for gluten contamination in these setups. I think that's a really good point. And along those lines, a lot of times they're traveling a lot for different competitions. They're on the road, they're eating out. Um, so I think just speaking to a dietitian and really diving into where all those potential exposures may be is very important. So I guess in the chat, we have the a response that the endurance athlete is very careful. Uh, there's no gluten in the house and absolutely the family makes everything from scratch and enhance with whole grains. So with that, um, as a response, I agree that yes, there should be a detailed discussion, uh, but let's, uh, with that response, uh, Dr. Murray, Stahl, Adams and Lee, what would you do? From my perspective as an adult, I would do a, probably the deamidated gliadin antibodies. And the rationale for that is there are some patients who persistently have autoimmunity, TTG autoimmunity, even in the absence of ongoing celiac disease. It's a small group, but it certainly can happen. Mm -hmm. If the deamidated gliadin is positive, then we know that they are getting gluten. You could use, I would use the strategy of the GIP um, detection methods to do that maybe three different days a week to identify if there's any source. It's likely inadvertent. Obviously, our dietitian colleagues are, are critical for going doing a deep dive to try and understand, is there some particular source that the patient and family are assuming is gluten-free but is not? Um, there also, I make sure that I'm, I'm interviewing the patient without a family member present, if they are at least most of mine, I still have adults who come with their moms, um, but I want to um, in, um, visit with them when the mom is not present because they're often a bit more than when the mom is present. So temptation is a very strong thing to resist. If I, if I could jump in on that too, because I think I find with our pediatric patients and our athletes in particular, the family may be totally on board but the coaches and the teammates may not. And, and that's something that the family can do an excellent job at home, but it may be just things that the, 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 the child may not be aware of that are, as Joe said, you know, there could be inadvertent gluten. Where are they stopping on the way back from the match or the meat or something? And just, you know, there could be other ways that gluten is getting in. And we do need to do that deep dive, especially with the 17 year old and know 
you know, apologies to the parents, we need to talk to the child alone because a lot more comes out in that conversation and we can really dive down deep. At 17, are they even going out with their friends and having a drink? You know, so there's so many levels of things that you really need to, to you know, peel that onion back and find out what's going on. Um, and it could be something as simple as they didn't understand an ingredient or they didn't, weren't able to read a label. And so we really need to have really good, deep discussions. I think may, may, I, may I come with, with a comment here as well, uh, Ritu? Uh, Absolutely. I am not completely convinced that uh, this situation indicates uh, non-compliance. Uh, actually, we have looked carefully into uh, activated T-cells in the setting, a full year follow-up uh, in well-treated celiacs uh, with regular transglutaminase. Uh, level, they go down, and uh, DGP go down, uh, mucosal healing, everything looks nice. And still those T cells are quite activated after a full year of, uh, of good treatment. So I, I, and I, I think I see this every now and then, uh, this kind of situation where everybody are convinced. I mean, non-compliance is is a big problem, of course, we know that. But some, in some cases, I think persistent mucosal uh, 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 immunopathology does exist in the setting of celiac disease. And I would agree with you, Dr. London. It is something that I mm. see often in, um, mm. in my office as well, where, mm. um, again, that the situation is similar. Everyone's gluten-free and you're still having C symptoms. So I think mm. partnering with a dietitian is extremely important. Mm. But then looking at other things, I mean, I guess you could have celiac and IBD. You can have celiac and other conditions as well. So I agree mm. our first inclination has to be let's look at the diet and where they could potentially be sources uh, which may not be a deliberate source it could be just a source that is accidental and I think having a dietitian who is very experienced is important right um, and then looking at um, sources and other conditions as well that one would need to look at uh, with that I would hope that I am assuming everyone would agree with that well, Bana has a comment, but may I also just say we have a lot of questions and we have only 20 minutes left. So I think we should consider going on. But Bana, you want to please short comment. Yeah, no, I, I just want to insist on the fact that uh, it things are more complex than what it seems. We cannot just look at Willis atrophy. Uh, it's very clear that mm. the functional program of the epithelial cells uh, beyond villus atrophy is important. As Dr. Adams uh, you know, indicated, we know still very little systematically about mm. metabolic profiling in conjunct conjunction with analysis of transcriptional profiling, immune cell activation, et cetera. So I think we still have a lot to learn mm. And we cannot continue, you know, to pet, put our hand, uh, our head in the sand and mm -hmm. uh, do as if we can just look at all these things individually. I think we have to design mm -hmm. new studies that are more integrated studies uh, and, and with the new technologies that are available. Mm. Okay, certainly. Rita, may I suggest that we go on with the next question? Uh, Absolutely. Which is uh, maybe a difficult question to ask. Is there any relationship between leaky gut syndrome and celiac disease? And that is not easy to answer, is it? Because in my view, I mean, I'm we are well familiar with celiac disease, but uh, what is exactly leaky gut sy uh, sy uh, uh, syndrome? Would anybody like to comment on this? Maybe Joe, would you? Would you? Yeah, sure. So yeah. But when we think about leaky gut syndrome, what mm. does it mean? We know that the mucosa is inherently permeable. It's supposed to allow things to get in. It's regulated tightly. So I presume one could mm. use the term leaky gut when it's become excessively permeable. Anything that damages the intestine will do it. So celiac disease almost by definition will produce mm leakiness to micro and macro molecules. Mm -hmm. um, what happens in the healed celiac disease, it may be that mm 
heal celiac mm. patients still have some minor predisposition to increased leakiness. Mm. The whole co concept of a syndrome that's totally dependent just on leakiness alone, um, as in the kind of alternative medicine area, mm. is probably not with a lot of, of science behind it. Uh, I agree. I agree with that, uh, Joe. Mm. Uh, I have any thoughts, Bana? Yeah, no, and again, the leaky gut, there's a lot of studies in inflammatory bowel disease, in mm -hmm. celiac disease, in food allergy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's still a lot, again, mechanistically to learn about mm -hmm. that. And I just want to remind what Dr. Stappenbeck uh, showed, where when he showed that those uh, epithelial cells that were, uh, you know, those uh, atrophic epithelial cells, mm. that they were actually also connected to barrier dysfunction. And so, and we also yeah. know through the studies of Jerry Turner and others, that when you have TNF increase uh, and interferon gamma increase, those affect tight junctions. So uh, any even inflammatory uh, activation in absence of bilis atrophy, just mm -hmm. by the mere presence of those inflammatory cytokines mm -hmm. can change the tight junctions. So uh, again, uh, I, I think the time is uh, now to uh, do mechanistic studies linked mm -hmm. to clinical phenotypes. So I think your comment, Vanna, uh, uh, means that in celiac disease, the gut is leaky. That there is a certain leakiness, but, but yes. you know, when people ask, is it primary or is it secondary? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a very different question because it even is. in family members, and that's a study we published in collaboration with mm. Joe Murray and Pete Green, we see that in family members of celiac disease that don't have anti-transglutaminase antibodies, you can do or you can already have epithelial defects that you see by electron microscopy and by immunostochemistry, but you don't see it with classical histology. Exactly. And, and, and why is that? So is this constitutive? Is it linked to microbial interaction? Is it linked to the presence of already an inflammatory immune response? I think that's what we need to answer. Mm. Ritu, should we go on? Absolutely. Ne it's next good. one is, I mean, it, it stated that 50% uh, of celiac disease patients also have IBS. I would say that no patients with celiac disease have IBS as an ex exclusion, but this is a semantic question, of course, and we could, we could discuss that at length. But in the traditional view, you would say that IBS is a condition where organic diseases is ruled out. Then what about Treat, well treated celiac disease, for sure they have much IBS like symptoms. And we recently showed that if you take away FODMAP from their otherwise completely gluten free diet, they, their symptoms uh, uh, get better. So, uh, uh, but I don't think this will be a topic uh, uh, for this talk, this, uh, the, the, this symposium. Yes, yeah, so I think we could move mm. on to the next mm. question where yeah. there is a premenopausal celiac okay. person mm. uh, in her 20s with celiac disease who already has osteoporosis. What do you do? So Dr. Lee, um, perhaps mm. from your standpoint, and then um, Dr. Adams or Murray, and uh, I'll leave pediatric GI alone for a little bit. <laughs> from our standpoint, we'd want to make sure that um, we really are looking at it at all her lab work, again, her diet, um, to really see also what is she doing in terms of, um, I think Dr. Stahl had mentioned lifestyle and Dr. Adams had too, where are, is she engaged in any, you know, weight bearing activity? What is her whole, you know, the whole picture looking like? Um, we would definitely want to make sure we're getting a DEXTA or following on the DEXTA and, um, and looking at all that lab value and making sure there's you know, the, that she's having adequate calcium rich foods, you know, her grains, her, her fiber, all of that. It also depends on is she, is this a new diagnosis of celiac disease and are we expecting to see some um, bone um, gain over the next year or so? Um, is she a very thin celiac disease patient? Does she have eating disorder? Um, other risk factors, family history, does she have a fracture? Um, but honestly, if she are, if she's 
that young um, and already has osteoporosis in her 20s. I'm probably also going to get the opinion from one of my bone colleagues um, mm -hmm. to make sure she doesn't have another disorder on top of all of that. Um, especially if she's already a year gluten free, I'd be more concerned and want to send for a referral. And this is Joe here. Um, I also think of, of osteomalacia as a signif more significant issue with this young. Does the patient have osteomalacia, do they need often what I call malabsorption doses of vitamin D? That's mm -hmm. 50,000 units weekly or twice weekly. Mm -hmm. That level of vitamin D requires close monitoring. Um, but usually patients at this age, you can get tremendous recovery. At the other end, that's the older patients where they're starting on, anti, on osteoporosis therapy. I have not found that oral bisphosphonates are especially well tolerated or useful in the celiac patients. Now, it's anecdotal. I can't say there's evidence to back that up, but those drugs are poorly absorbed. So I'm typically, I won't say influencing, but maybe suggesting to my bone colleagues that we think of something parenteral other than just an oral bisphosphonate in the circumstance of treating osteoporosis in the context of a celiac. Mm -hmm. Bana, anything from the lab that you'd like to add to this from a bone disease standpoint? Yeah, again, I, I really enjoyed the lab, uh, Dr. Adams' uh, presentation. I, I, I think she pointed out to the complexity of all those questions. And I, I, I think also, you know, what she indicated, is it a resistance to, uh, to certain uh, hormones or is it uh, a lack of, uh, you know, absorption? Again, the only thing I would say is, we need more studies in that field. And I think the reason we to you and I decided to have a symposium on that topic is because we recognized that there was a huge gap in celiac disease and that uh, we needed to address this question. So for me, this is you know our first meeting uh, where we have uh, wonderful experts on this panel to uh, start having this discussion and then seeing how to best move forward. Mm -hmm. So if we were to, I know we don't have a lot of time, but if I was to pose this question to each one of you, and I'm going to leave Bana towards the end because I just want to know how do we go from the bench to the bedside? So we're talking about healing. What is it? You know, we have patients on this uh, symposium. We have clinicians. We have researchers. We have um, a lot of different people here. What is it that as a patient, whether it's pediatrics or adult, what should I be looking out for from a healing standpoint? So there are symptoms, there's nutrition, there's labs, and what is the future? So what is the current and what's the future when I go to see my physician or my team and I have celiac disease? How do I know that I'm healing or I have healed? So I'm going to start with Dr. Murray since you were the first speaker for this session. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? And then we can go pie in the sky. Uh, what would Bana tell us that we need to do? I am a little old fashioned, I will say. And as if someone really wants to know if they've healed, I want to biopsy them. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we're doing digital pathology, I show patients their villi. Um, and both at diagnosis as well as um, on recovery. So um, I find that's quite powerful, both as an affirmation for patients' effort, as well as an encouragement to continue. And um, so I can use, I will use all these other things, improvement in symptoms, correction of deficiencies, you know, negativity of serology, um, but all of those are surrogates. So in an adult patient, um, I'm going to biopsy them, most likely. And you would biopsy who? Yeah, excuse me, Joe. Whom are you going to biopsy? Routinely or selected? Yeah, routinely, patients? I biopsy. Okay. I recommend that individuals diagnosed as adults, I biopsy them routinely. So do I. So do I. Good to hear. Okay, thank and you. And when you say when you say routine, what's routine for adults? Oh, for for us, it would be. I typically aim it for about two years after diagnosis when they've been on a diet on a gluten-free diet for two years. If I have a younger patient, you know, perhaps who's become seronegative very quickly and they had partial villus atrophy to begin with, I might 
pull the trigger on a rebiopsy earlier at one year or 18 months. But typically, I want them to reach zero negativity at least six months before I rebiopsy them. Now, if I have somebody who's two years out, they tell me they're absolutely gluten free and their ETG is still positive, that patient I will biopsy because it might be that their TTG antibodies are just lagging behind or persistently positive, and it may be causing them some anxiety. And knowing that their biopsies are normal, I think can be quite reassuring for them. So both for Dr. London and Murray, you feel very comfortable that if you have a normal biopsy, there's healing. Yes. Okay. I would say Dr. yes. Adams. All right, Dr. Adams your opinion, what would you do to tell your patient who's coming in? And you know, we all do many different things. So what would you do? Um, well, I, I do have to um, go with the expertise and seniority of Dr. Murray and Dr. London. I also mm -hmm. recommend biopsy for most of my patients. Um, I think there's also a lot to be said about, as Dr. Murray hinted at, that um, sense of um, relief they have when they have healing. I think that brings a lot to the care of the patient and them feeling validated in what they've done with their diet and the changes that they've made. I will have to say, though, based on the presentation I showed today, we're still seeing changes even in people that have healing based on our traditional biopsy. And whether that would be different if we were reporting height to crypt death and maybe a little bit more in detail about what exactly is healing. I mean, my biopsies are just either mild flattening or severe, and that's the most that I get. Um, I did a small study looking at mucosal impedance and whether or not that's a good marker for integrity, but saw very different readings in patients with traditional healed biopsies as compared to those with unhealed biopsies and compared to controls. So I do think there's something still to be said there that um, needs further research. But as of now, clinically, I'm doing exactly what Dr. Murray and Dr. London said in discussing a biopsy after about two years. So not really paying that much attention to labs per se. And maybe I'm just being a little over dramatic by saying not paying attention. IFC is healed and clinically they're feeling well. They don't have signs of malabsorption or severe deficiencies. If their TTG IgA were to be mildly elevated, I'm not sure I would do anything differently with that. Um, if their biopsies were normal and they were having a lot of symptoms, I'd probably pursue a capsule or other workup as Dr. Murray went down that line. Um, but I think you also have to put it in the perspective of how the patient's acting and behaving and, and how they're presenting. Thank you. Dr. Stahl, from a pediatric standpoint, what would you say? Yeah, so I think it's a little bit different within pediatric care in terms of doing repeat biopsies. I do not standardly do that with my patients. And when um, I'm first talking to them about the diagnosis and the follow-up, I say we're going to follow up on three specific things. Symptoms, if you're having them. TTG, um, which we as we discussed earlier, is not a perfect proxy. And then um, I think the thing that I have best to rely on is interview with our dietitian. And I really rely on our dietitian to um, determine, you know, dietary adherence. Um, I think pie in the sky, um, I think there will be a day where we are more routinely doing biopsies in pediatrics, but I wonder, you know, if we're going to need more non-invasive methods before that really becomes standard of care. So things like transnasal endoscopy, looking at other disease models like eosinophilic esophagitis, where they're starting to use things like the string test to monitor healing. Um, you know, will we eventually have tools like that within C celiac disease. Um, and then I think once we are at a point of more routinely getting um, follow-up biopsies, the other question that I guess I have clinically is like, can we show for our patients that this actually matters, that like complete mucosal healing mm -hmm. matters to them? Because I think in the pediatric population, it's really hard to just like wrap your head around cancer, but there are other more concrete things like growth or bone health that we could show um, it has clear impacts. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Lee, when patients come to you and say, okay, do you think I'm healed? What should I be looking out for? What do you tell them? Actually, it's, it's a combination of what has been said. It's, I really have a deep discussion with them on how are they feeling? What are their symptoms? But I also advocate for 
I send them back to the to their docs to look for a biopsy. I actually see both adults and pediatrics. So with adults, I do, I send them back and say, maybe it's time to get a biopsy to see. And what I find often is that relief that the patient has and that improvement in their quality of life when they know that everything they've been doing for the past two years has paid off and they see healing. Um, as Dr. Stahl said, with my pediatric patients, I often, you know, we're, they may not be biopsied again, but I use their growth charts, I use their increase in height and weight to show the healing. And um, for me, a pie in the sky, I would love to see us look into the microbiome and how that affects it. Does that, can we, like as Bana said, look at all those multiple factors and maybe that will help give us insight into who we see that will be healing and who we may work need to work on more closely and look at other aspects to promote that healing. Thank you. So Dr. Jabri, oh, Dr. London, go ahead. Yeah, this is a very interesting conversation, I think. Uh, but I just want to remind you, I've been co-author of several guidelines uh, for the last almost, well, 10, 15 years. Uh, the Ludwigson guidelines, uh, the European guidelines, which have been a uh, numerical success. In neither of them, we agreed on rebiopsy. And I take part in a, a group of almost 20 experts. And uh, I think I'm the only one who advocates rebiopsy. It's uh, just to remind you, the, the people who attend this, uh, this uh, uh, conference uh, shouldn't immediately think that uh, rebiopsy is, is a default uh, in uh, celiac disease uh, care, because most people that I know of say, sorry, we have stopped it which I not necessarily agree with it. And Joe, you showed, showed some data and slide from, a, from our own study in Norway. You mislabeled it as a Finnish study, but never mind. It's a, but in fact, uh, everybody healed after seven years, mm -hmm. but there was no difference in those who had had a rebiopsy and those who did not have a rebiopsy in the course of this. After a year, only some heal after seven years in our society, everybody heal more or less, unless if they are compliant. But, but rebiopsy was not a predictor of later healing, which of course makes us think, but I'm a believer still. Thank you. And Dr. <laughs> Jabri, from the lab to, from your bench to our bedside, what do you think? Yeah, so, 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 so. <laughs> So first, I just want to remind that despite everything that has been done in celiac disease, and I think the research community in celiac disease clinical and research is amazing, uh, with mm -hmm. really huge collaboration and interaction. Mm -hmm. Despite all that, there are like key questions to which we don't have any answer. Why do children heal better than adults, even with similar gluten-free diet? Why uh, do metabolic defects not correlate with degree of villous atrophy. Why do you have patients, as uh, uh, Knut indicated, that can still see immune activation, even on a gluten-free diet, when transglutaminase antibodies have disappeared? And why do you see, for equal gluten contamination, differences in, in healing? So I I think we have to acknowledge as a community that we don't have answers to those questions. So you can you know, put forward any study you want right now. We do not have answers to those questions, which means we need to do more and better. And I, and I am a strong believer being myself a physician and a scientist that the only way to move forward is to do amazing good clinical phenotyping combined with analysis that are much more refined. And, will, and histology is not enough. You can have a completely normal histology. I'm, I'm ready to show you a slide with perfect villi and electron microscopy shows completely abnormal epithelial cells or sees inflammatory markers mm -hmm. in epithelial cells. So we cannot rely just on histology. We have to use all the new technologies, all the advances in science as a community to come together together 
and change the way we are analyzing the data. And we too, you know very well, and Joe knows very well in the context of the RC2 grant we have put together. When we looked at how many patients have metabolic profiles that are done on a system, in a systematic manner, it's completely random and only in a limited number of patients. How do you want to make conclusions if you don't have a, a guideline with systemic metabolic profiling that combines everything that Dr. Adams has indicated across all patients combined with histology, <clears throat> combined with refined analysis to really start understanding what is happening. So I, my answer is we have, we came a long way and we still have a long way to go. And what we should be doing is uh, not being afraid to challenge ourselves and ask ourselves what needs to be done to really move forward. Thank you. Um, I think what we were initially talking about is what do we really have right now? And we have something, maybe biopsy, some labs, and we need to look at studies and do more investigation and more thought processes that need to go. But um, just want to thank everyone. Uh, this has been interesting. I know we could continue to talk just about this for the rest of the day, but we have a few more things happening for the rest of the day. So thank you very much.